Hello, everyone, and welcome back to block party number 50. This is the 50th block party. We started on uh, Valentine's Day, February 14th, 2020. It's now February 12th, 2021. This would be block party number 52, but we took two Fridays off during the holidays, give ourselves a little break. Super excited to be here, and we always kick off the block party with food healers, and then 12 hours later, we have the evening shift, and here we are, and Silish, uh, creator of food healers, has some news for us, so Silish, <laughs> take it away. <laughs> I don't have news for me, for you, I'm just going to give it off to BJ and say, okay, tell us what the news should be, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my goodness, today we heard some great news and I, the paper that we love so much and that we, we refer to and give to people, the position paper that's on Climate Healers, Dr. Rao got noticed today. Do you want to tell that news? Oh, okay, that one, yeah, sure. That one. <laughs> Yeah, that is being accepted for publication in the Journal of Ecological Society. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah. That is so, so great. Thank you. So, which means, you know, they have reviewed it and they, they think it's worth publishing and they're going to put it in the April issue. Um, this journal actually comes out once every year, once every two years. Um, so, it's, it's, so it's all invited papers only. And they had asked me for the paper and I never hear, heard back from them. <clears throat> I submitted the paper in, uh, when is it, December or no, January of 2020. And then I never heard back from them. And I, and I asked, you know, I mean, I actually reminded them a couple of times, you know, what's happening with the paper. I didn't hear back. And apparently they were sending me some email, email from another email account. <laughs> it probably went to spam. I have no idea what happened. But they said, we already reviewed it and we accepted it. How come you don't know yet? <laughs> I said, okay. <laughs> but because of the pandemic, we, we didn't publish in 2020 and we're going to publish in 2021. So, okay. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> I signed up to get the paper, <laughs> to get the, you know, I went to their website. I put my name in. Okay. <laughs> Okay, good, good, yeah. How much is the subscription to, so what was the paper again? In Journal of Ecological Society. Um, it's, a, it's a very old journal. It's been around for 40 years or so. It was started by an ec ecologist in India, <clears throat> Dr. Prakash Gole. <coughs> and um, so he was ahead of his time. You know, at that time he was talking about climate change and uh, uh, extinction. So, uh, so they basically have kept it like a small journal that gets invited papers every year. So they had invited me to give the, the Prakash Gole Memorial Lecture in 2019, December. And so, so they did some betting and, and, all, and they uh, selected me as the, as the speaker for that year. And at the end of that, they um, asked if they could publish my paper. And I said, sure. You know, I mean, basically that's how it started happening, right? But then when I didn't hear back from them, I assumed that they were not interested because, you know, I've heard this before from <laughs> Nature Magazine, Science Magazine. They all don't want to publish it, right? Because it's too hot, um, too yeah. controversial. Congratulations on you getting it published, but also congratulations to them for having the courage to publish it where so many others uh, saw it. And, and you said that even some have peer reviewed it and they haven't rejected it based on any inaccuracies, just that it's too hot to handle, that, that it's uh, so much in the face of what the mainstream narrative is, has uh, accepted. And I do mean the right. word accepted, it's just acceptable science at this point. There hasn't really been the vigor applied to it and uh, now this is really a, opening the gates to really get, get to work on it. And yeah, emphasize yeah. that it's not science done, it's science begun in, in a sense. It's really engineering start, it begun, you know, it's engineering mm -hmm. begun because science, you can ask any question and answer it. It doesn't matter. Engineers have to say, what is the most likely thing that happened? <laughs> 
<laughs> because we have to build things that actually work, right? <laughs> you can't be sitting around thinking of, you know, all possibilities. And measure things in ways that are that are practical and workable rather than measuring things in a ways that are politically palatable. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Schenker's here now, so you gotta start all over again. <laughs> Hi, Marco. You have you have a question? Yeah, Schenker, welcome back. Schenker, go ahead, Marco. I was trying to look through the journal, but there's nothing worded exactly the way you said it. Is there a... Yeah, I'll put the link up on the chat. Okay, thank um, you. And congratulations. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> I mean, it is, a, um, it is a small journal that only appears once every year or so. And, uh, in, and only invited uh, presentations. This is a, 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 a you know a leverage to be able to, to share with the vegan community in particular and the scientific community because we're so often handcuffed to well we only talk about peer reviewed literature so yeah, this, this exactly, is peer reviewed yeah. literature so it's now yeah. something that we could talk about and most importantly just get the conversation going because it was so stagnant like basically one one uh, kick at the can in the math um, by the FAO one alternative viewpoint saying you should look at your numbers again from the right. bank right. and they did look at the numbers again and lowered the numbers <laughs> <laughs> and left it there ever since so i mean it's obviously a case of we see the numbers that we politically find palatable so let's move on and we don't really need to have any sort of attention to animal agriculture emissions and there haven't been any and something else happened you know today uh, i i mean i got an um a writer contacted me because he's writing a book and he wanted to do a chapter on uh, animal agriculture and and its uh, and environmental impact. And so he asked me questions about what happened with Al Gore. And so he, he wanted me to dig up the old letters that I had sent to Al Gore and the response from Al Gore. And so it made me just go back in my memory lane, right? So pick up emails from 2009 and 2012 and put it together. So uh, it's fascinating, you know, because those, uh, because it's clearly even in 2012, we had it. We knew that they were not telling us the truth, right? So there was a letter that uh, went out to Al Gore that he didn't reply to. And that's when I walked out and um, protested, right? So I was able to relive all that and I had to send him all the letters. I think, I don't know what he's gonna do with it. I said, it's public domain, take it, take, do what you want with it. Yeah, I can post that too here. Let me add that file. Oh. And you had a significant number of people uh, sign on to your letter and to Katie Cantrell's in the in the uh, other climate reality presenters, so the volunteers right. that learned how to do Al Gore's presentation, they yeah. all read that letter. They've yeah. contributed their letters as well, right? And signed on to uh, Katie Cantrell was uh, wrote a, an open letter to Mr. Gore, right? And, yeah. and attached your much older letters to them. <laughs> and they yeah. had a couple hundred people sign on to them. So these are people that, that got the Al Gore training and kind of going, well, why isn't there any animal agriculture stuff in this presentation? And uh, they were promised an answer to this letter and they never received it. Wow. You know, that's a good point you bring up, Ray. I think I should get back on the Climate Reality website and uh, post that this white paper has been accepted for publication. Yeah. Um, so bring up the 87%. Forget 51%. Let's go to the 87% now. Well, you're still in the Climate Reality Hub, as far as I know. Because yeah, yeah, I'm still that's there. That's where I, where I found you the first time. <laughs> wow. Even though you, you did your dramatic uh, crossing <laughs> the floor to the, uh, the uh, activists protesting the, the training in 2012, I checked and you were still in the, uh, in the Reality <laughs> yeah. Hub. So you can okay. download Al Gore's latest doc, uh slideshow and see if there's anything new on agriculture in it. I do every once in a while. You do that. Uh, the last time I did, there were 540 odd slides and there were zero slides in animal agriculture. 
Well, now they know that people don't have an attention span. So there's a, uh, a slideshow with 10 slides in it. <laughs> <laughs> it. Used to be two hours of slideshows. That was essentially the training. The first day he would give his two hour presentation with hundreds of slides in it. Yeah. And then the next day he said, I'll show you how to do it. You'll, you'll get a 20 minute slot to, to do your presentation realistically. So we'll, we'll do the 20 minute version. And it was in the 20 minute version that he said that there's one slide that's got a picture of cows on it. And, and these are the other sources of, of uh, fossil fuel emissions, <laughs> uh, of emissions other than fossil fuels. Don't spend much time on this, on this card. So there's one <laughs> card and he says not spend much time on it. And I was taking the training with Anita Kreins of the, the uh, save movement. And then we had a, a coffee break right afterwards, right after he said that. And she met up, she was at a different table. She met up with coffee. She said, that's it, call in Jenny. <laughs> <laughs> so we called in the activists to uh, disrupt Al Gore. Jenny, so they, give Jenny him a has coffee so much Jenny. courage. <laughs> she, just, she just got up on the stage and gave Al Gore a copy of uh, Cowspiracy on DVD. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, BJ. Well, that, that's fun and fascinating. And, and I would like to know why in the world he didn't do, why he didn't, didn't look at it you know why and why he still doesn't come out and say hey this is what we got to do but the paper will help um well he's, wanted... the, he's the chairman of of uh, climate re climate reality but he's not the ceo so <laughs> in, in in other words he's kind of a figurehead for that organization so the people who collect the donations they're they're the ones that make the decisions ah uh, okay well my question is i wonder if this is another topic so we can come back to this one but um Dr. Brown, have you, have you got a letter for the engineers? I know two engineers. I would like to see if they will read the paper and sign on to oh, it. Oh, yeah. No, I'm, uh, I'm rewriting it. Um, so I, uh, I'm hopefully by the end of next week, I'll have the rewritten version ready. They're rewriting it as engineer solutions to scientists' warnings. Good. That's what Damon suggested, yeah. So as opposed to engineers warning again, you know, why warn? I mean, we are the, we are the solvers, right? We need to solve our problems. <laughs> yeah. Right. I love it. Okay, fantastic. Yeah. So we are is, sort of reframing it. Yeah. Is the best strategy for you to write this as the, as the author and after you get it published, then, then look for more collaborations? Or is it the sort of thing that you would benefit from having other people pile on and, and have co-authors? Oh, in the engineer solutions, I would love to have lots of co-authors because it's uh, it's about all of us engineers getting together and saying, yeah, we can do this, you know. And you want engineers in particular? I want engineers in particular because uh, engineers are the ones who who really have to build things, and so they, you know, I mean, you can. So it's a different mindset, you know, um, that we are trained with. Uh, I try so to we, think. Of of references in the, in, if anybody watches Big Bang Theory, it's, it's about theoretical physicists and they have one friend who's an engineer and they pick on him all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, well. <laughs> There's lots of engineer jokes, but obviously they're the ones that get, get stuff done, get stuff actually built. Theoretical yeah, science is just theory until somebody can prove that it actually works. Yeah, without engineers, the scientists are not able to measure anything, okay? So <laughs> go ahead, Marco. My father-in-law was a, was a civil engineer, and he used to say, architects make pretty buildings, engineers make them work. <laughs> right. That's right. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, for instance, you know, because basically the white paper is an engineering analysis. It really wasn't, there is no new science in the sense I didn't go and, uh, um, you know, analyze something and figure out something new there. I was just taking existing science and doing an engineering analysis. And in, in such engineering analysis, you find that, yeah, you know, this science is not complete. For instance, the science of the uh, carbon cycle of vegetation versus breathing. That's not complete without, without uh, error bars on the measurements. You know, I mean, how far off are you? You cannot you cannot tell me they are identical <laughs> because engineers hate that word. These two are matched exactly. I said, wait, no, it's never matched exactly. There's always an error. 
there's nothing in nature is perfect. Nothing in nature is identical to something else in nature. So, yeah, and so there were both, this is why, you know, it's, there are so many big holes in the IPCC's science we found. Go ahead, Jamin. I will. Hey. Oh, no, go, go ahead. Was that, oh, uh, Ingrid, yeah, go ahead, Ingrid. I just uh, would like to make sure I understood what was just said. Uh, are there two different things or did you mean the same thing? You said nothing in nature is perfect and then you said nothing is in nature is identical to an, another thing or to each other, something like that? Yeah. Uh, did you mean two different things or were you just... So, like nothing in nature is perfect or then then you said the other one so i no, just no, no. I, yeah i should be I, no, maybe let me rephrase it i was trying to say the same thing i was trying to say the same thing so everything in nature is unique meaning there are no two things are identical no two things are the same uh, in the inter, in the IPCC's the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, in their report, they claim that vegetation perfectly balances breathing. Okay, the carbon from vegetation perfectly balances the carbon for breathing. So you don't have to look at that at all. So we only have to look at the the anthropogenic changes, the man-made changes that we are putting like fossil fuels, but it is not, it's never. So as an engineer, I, I questioned that right away. You know, I questioned it right away and said, no. And especially when that cycle is 20 times bigger than our fossil fuel cycle. And if you have a 5% error, that's bigger than your fossil fuel cycle, <laughs> right? <laughs> because it's 20 times bigger. It's like so, a pretty bizarre thing to you. believe that that there would be as many cows as to offset the the and, and they'd be breathing the same amount of carbon dioxide. Right. I mean, you see, we have to, created such imbalance in nature, and yet we are pretending nature is perfectly balanced. <laughs> that's the thing, right? That's the thing that's mind-boggling to me that only scientists would allow that to happen. That's Engineers kind of would have said, that, absolutely that, not. Go, go back there and figure out what the error is, you know? <laughs> what the mismatch is. <laughs> that species choose their population size based on the amount of available oxygen created by trees. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> go ahead, BJ. You're muted. You're on, you're on mute, BJ. So I'm wondering, when you said 20 times bigger, mm. could you... Uh, are you talking about the percentage of car methane compared to carbon? What is the 20, what is the 20 times bigger? Oh, okay. So there is a carbon cycle. Okay. There is carbon being emitted from uh, vegetation, uh, you know, as vegetation decays and dies. So then carbon goes up in the air and then trees breathe carbon in, and then they store it as um, in their trunks and their branches. So it's photosynthesis happens. So there's breathing from, from vegetation, from decaying vegetation and from animals. And then there is photosynthesis. And so the, that cycle, the amount of carbon that's involved in that cycle is 20 times bigger than the amount of carbon that we are putting into the atmosphere from burning fossil fuels. 20 times bigger. <laughs> okay, so here we are talking about you know 10 gigatons of carbon. There you're talking about 200 gigatons of carbon because that's how much is going up in the air and coming down. It's not just on the land, but also in, from the ocean. Right? There's vegetation in the ocean. There are animals in the ocean. So, uh, so when when something is 20 times bigger, and you tell me that you know there is a, there is something going up and something coming down, and they're both perfectly balanced, so you don't have to look at it. I immediately jump up and say, as an engineer, I object. <laughs> you know, <laughs> get back over there and figure out what the error is, you know, <laughs> what the mismatch is. 
<laughs> so anyway, uh, that was the first boo-boo I saw right away in the IPCC's report. And uh, and then of course, I mean, I was like, my God, the, we don't even know what the error is. How the heck are we doing this, right? I mean, then you go look and look closely, you discover they're not looking at that because it, uh, it will, so they did everything that they did in the IPCC report was to put the thumb on the scale to make it look like animal agriculture is not such a big deal. <laughs> so it was deliberate. It was deliberate. So you can see that the industry is in there. In the industry scientists were part of the IPCC. So they were putting their thumb on the scale. They said, just, just focus on fossil fuels. That's it. Now don't look at anything else. So that's what they were doing. And yet we we quote the IPCC, the IPCC. We have we have to quote that and we uh, so we acknowledge that there's errors, but that's the most recent uh, data that right. people are going by. So right. you know, so we put it on things, but we do have right. to be aware of the errors. Yeah. Right. And there are caveats, you know, meaning there are caveats. I'm saying even if the IPCC's numbers are correct, it's still, it's 87% of it is coming from animal agriculture. Now, the IPCC is, we know, is filled with an industry scientists. And therefore, I don't know whether only 37% of the methane is from animal agriculture. Maybe they put their thumb on the scale there too. <laughs> Maybe it's more than 37%, maybe it's 60%. From, I don't know, right? When you have a biased uh, bunch of scientists looking at data and compiling data, who knows what they omitted? Right. It's like asking the tobacco scientists, hey, hey, is tobacco harmful for human beings? <laughs> and then saying, okay, the tobacco scientists said it's not harmful to human beings. Okay, yeah, all right, keep smoking. You know, that's what we're doing with the, with the planet. Go ahead, Jamin. Uh, actually, I'll, I'll defer to Shankar first and then, then I'll talk. Go ahead, Shankar. No, no problem. Thank you. Actually, I had a, a salary when you mentioned one question came in my mind. Like, you know, there is one cooling effort ha happens because of the fossil fuel industry or the burning industry, right? Do we have any associations or the group of people like a, who are, or the like a group include trade or scientists from the chloro if they come and present on that part, you know, it's, it could be a tiny bunch of uh, professional organizations or trade associations, but if mm -hmm. they can come and present like how important they are, so probably you think one side, another, somebody's talking loud about it. Yeah, um, I don't know, you know, there is, uh, I mean, you could go and ask the Exxon Mobil scientists to come and talk about that. You know, that's, I mean, we have to stoop to such levels, right? <laughs> so I'd rather not go there. I mean, I really think we need citizen science to deal with planetary issues. We, don't, we want science that is unbiased, as unbiased as possible. So, and fundamentally it has to be all vegan scientists. Because if you're eating meat, then you don't want to think about it. And you, know, you want to pretend it's not so harmful, right? <clears throat> so I think that's where the, um, I mean, that's where we are headed. Ultimately, we really have to have a group of scientists who are doing unbiased science, as unbiased as possible, because we are making decisions on this. It's a little like saying, you know, if I were to build a rocket to, that goes to the moon, um, do you want someone from the industry like Morton Thayakal coming and telling you, oh yeah, the O-ring is great. <laughs> no, you want an independent guy verifying that the O-ring is great, okay? <laughs> because Morton Thayakal said the O-ring is great because they're selling it to you. <laughs> and the Space Shuttle Challenger blew up because we believed them. Right? So, But there, I mean, the engineers actually had figured out that the, the O-ring you know, cannot withstand low temperatures. They had actually warned NASA. So don't launch when the ambient temperature is below this 
uh, 30 degrees or 40 degrees Fahrenheit because the O-ring um, becomes brittle and it'll, it'll, it won't be able to withstand the pressures. So they had warned them, but uh, NASA administrators overrode the engineers and they went ahead and launched anyway. And then it blew up. So then when, when uh, Richard Feynman did his analysis as to why it blew up, he discovered that the administrators thought that the probability of um, the space shuttle blowing up was one in a hundred thousand. Okay. When he asked the engineers and their analysis showed it was one in a thousand. It's a big difference. Actually one in a hundred. <laughs> There's a big difference between one in a hundred versus one in a hundred thousand. So yeah, so how did this happen? You know, as it went up, someone, I mean, numbers got jiggered and, and then they said, oh yeah, let's launch. So engineering has to be done with unbiased data as much as possible, because otherwise you don't know, right? I mean, you will, you will have errors. Uh, we know, as engineers, we know that nothing is perfect, that, that there will be problems, there's a possibility that whatever you're choosing, whatever you're deciding may not work, right? So we figure out what is the probability of it not working and then we try to minimize that, right? I mean, when you design a chip, okay, when I design chips, um, the, you know, everything that we do is basically there's um, probabilities involved, right? So we are figuring out the three sigma you know, so the device could be here, or it could be there, it could be here. So you have to say, what is the fast, fast corner? What is the slow, slow corner? What is the slow, fast corner? What is the fast, slow corner? I mean, all kinds of corners we work on and make sure that it works in all of them. Okay. And only then we say, okay, go for it. Because that means that, yeah, there are some chips that won't work but they are outside the bounds of what we looked at. So meaning we have, we have made sure that those that don't work are like less than 0.1%. And so we select, we then test for them and throw them out before we put it on a, on a motherboard. Because when you, when you put a chip on this computer, you, you know, if you say, well, once in a while it will fail, <laughs> people are gonna be very upset with us, right? <laughs> <laughs> it has to work yeah, no matter what. Years, they'll be very happy with you. That's, that's a good, I like that. they will have to buy a new one in two years. <laughs> Game I mean, part of any of those kind of conversations, right? I've had conversations with my, you know, with my friends and cousins who complain about something not working. And I tell them, do you know how hard it is to make this thing work? <laughs> and you're complaining to me that it's not working. <laughs> People have gone through so much to get it to work right, okay? So, but anyway, uh, now we are dealing with the planet. And, you know, you can't have biased science <laughs> and you're dealing with the planet, right? Can't make decisions based on uh, some industry honcho telling you what is right. Well, I think their justification would be that, that they see every problem as something that the government has to solve. People can't do anything. So the government has to solve something. And they fighting fossil fuels is the perfect example to support their their philosophy, because you in order to build a renewable energy grid, you need the cooperation of the government. So everything that they, that goes through that filter has to fit those that requirement, because the the way the IPCC works, it's a a, a political body that asks scientists to do work. And then yeah. they pick over the science and, and publish just what's good for policymakers, not what's good for the public, not even what's good for, for reporters to talk to uh, the public about. It's about what can go into a policy. That's what the documents that come out the other end of the IPCC are. And I, I, I feel like I'm the only person that notices that the, all, the FAO doesn't follow that pattern. They just published their own stuff and everybody goes, oh yeah, okay, that's it. that's good enough. They didn't right. follow this this rigorous, you know, uh, the government requests what needs to be studied. They study it, nothing else, just what's been requested. 
and then they pick through it and, and decide what's palatable to publish. And if it's something that's, you know, would be a disaster for the economy, they'd say, yeah, don't publish that. Yeah. <laughs> Presumably. Yeah. It's all based on uh, what is, what is, um, what is good for the economy as it is constructed today. And the economy as it's constructed today is based on death for animals, diseases for human beings and destruction for the planet. And they're stuck there. You know, I mean, maybe they made some decisions in 100 years ago, 50 years ago, said, okay, we won't look at that, you know, and it's causing now more and more economic growth to happen with lots of heart attacks from people and, you know, diabetes is creating a $100 billion industry. Wow. So if suddenly someone comes along and says, oh, we'll wipe out diabetes, hey, there are a lot of vested interests who are going to lose money, right? And they're going to fight it. So we have a system in which those who have power are trying to maintain that power. You know, so go ahead, Jamin. You have your hands up, hand up for a long time. And then Mark. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. So I'd like to pose um, three riddles. And most of you probably know the answers, but I think it'd be good to go through the exercise anyway. So as context for these three riddles, we have two exponentials that are happening exponential planetary overheating and exponential destruction of the biosphere. Now we have three major levers for combating these, right? And so the one of these levers were very, as a species, we're very hesitant to do because of addiction, right? Another lever I'm posing, we're very hesitant to throw because of denial denial of how bad it is, how severe the situation is. And the other lever is the one that's getting 99% of the attention. Bill Gates' most recent book, it's all about this other lever, but this third and final lever that's getting all the attention, it's actually gonna have the opposite <laughs> impact of what we want it to have in the short term. Now, I think we need to start to frame things in this way that's kind of like a, a riddle, a puzzle. And whoa, I mean, now that I've framed it this way, it's kind of like a Monty Python skit or something. It's like, what? The one because of addiction, animal agriculture, meat and dairy, we're addicted. And part of the addiction I've suffered in my own family, it's not just what goes into my mouth, but what did my father and grandfather do for a living? My dad grew up on a dairy farm. And if you watch An Inconvenient Truth, there's a moment where he's looking back and looking at his dad. Oh, my dad was breeder of the month. And you hear him laugh from his heart. <laughs> you know, he's just like, he's, there's an attachment there, right? That's addiction, right? We're addicted to what our fathers did. Honor thy father and all that is a big part of Christian culture. Okay. The one where we're not throwing the lever because of denial, I'm saying that's solar radiation management. Mm -hmm. I'm saying, whoa, this, these exponent, this exponential overheating, which is the major driver, one of the two major drivers of the exponential destruction of the biosphere. One is animal agriculture, but the other is overheating. The Amazon's burning up for two reasons, animal agriculture and overheating. Australia is mainly burning up because of overheating, right? And then of course, the third one, the third lever, which is, you know, reduce emissions, right? Reducing the dirtiest emissions will reduce the particulates, which is an unintended form of SRM, but SRM is SRM, whether intentional or unintentional and it's keeping us alive. So um, I just wanted to throw that on the table. And I know Marco has his hand up, but I'd love to just hear people's reactions to the three major levers, right? And mm -hmm. there's really a fourth, which is like planting trees, but I would say that kind of goes hand in hand with eliminating animal agriculture, because right. animal agriculture is chopping down trees. And as right. soon as you back off on that and return the, the land to nature, nature naturally will plant trees. Right, and also we'll now have more land in which to go and plant trees that won't get decimated by animal agriculture. But I'd love to hear everyone's thoughts on that because we need to figure out a way to communicate this and to grapple with our own addictions, our own denial and our own counter productivity when it comes to reducing the dirtiest emissions, which people focus on first, right? I yield the talking feather, thank you. 
Marka, you want to add to that? Yeah, I no, I, I totally agree. There's, you know, we've got levers and, uh, you know, as far as politics go, they, they're always going to use the lever that, that, that promotes economic growth at the cost of anything else. Right. That's obviously the lever situation. And, and I want to let everybody else have a chance to respond to Jamin, and then I have a, a new, a, you know, another tangent. Go ahead, BJ. Okay, I'll respond. Um, a lot of people don't don't know that animal agriculture is actually the number one solution, or um, and when they do hear about it, yes, they have things to deal with. Number two, the SRM, I don't know if it's denial yet because they don't know it, but you know, there's this not knowing thing. So you've got behind curtain number three <laughs> is the fossil fuels and every that is just now becoming aware. I mean, it's been 10 years or a lot of years for now that's up there. And oh my gosh, people have been working out that for so long. How are they gonna, how are they gonna shift and even look at those other two things. Um, right. So yeah, I, I like the way you put it in, in three ways. Since I'm just learning a little bit about SRM, I have to, um, I have to try to be open to that because, uh, because that's anti-nature to me. Uh, and I'm, I'm pro-nature to put mirrors, you know, all around. It, it feels that way, but I have to, but I have to be open to Whatever the solution is, we have to, to do mm -hmm. it as long as it doesn't hurt people and animals. Yeah, now the way I think about it, BJ, is that you know when we build houses, we cut down trees and we build roads, we are changing the reflectivity of the planet. Okay, we are changing the reflectivity of the planet. So we are, the roads are all black, so which means they're absorbing solar energy, right? So we did that deliberately and we thought it was part of nature, right? When we did that. I'm saying, hey, if you go put reflective uh, uh, white roofs, that's also part of nature. And we can all do that. You know, that will reflect some of the sunlight back. And then we can put more white stuff, you know, where we used to have sun. I mean, we used to have snow and ice that was reflecting energy back from the, from the sun. And that has become dark water now because we melted the ice. <laughs> and... And James Lovelock is calculating that that melting of the ice is actually going to absorb more energy than all the greenhouse gases we put into the atmosphere. So, so clearly it's gonna double the heating of the planet if we let it happen, right? So which means you have to replace that white stuff that melted with something else that's white, okay? That's reflecting solar, solar energy back. And that's what Jamin's talking, that's what they're all talking about as solar radiation management, you know? So to me, it is, is recognizing that we are part of a larger system and that we have messed it up, you know, that we have modified it. And therefore let's consciously modify it in a way that is good for all of us, okay? Because as I said, once we acknowledge that we have changed the climate of the planet, that we have the power to change the climate of the planet and we are doing it, then we have automatically assumed the responsibility for maintaining that climate. We can't just suddenly say, well, let nature, mother nature deal with it. You know, let the bears and the lions figure it out. You know, we will just do what we have to do and we'll just uh, return back to nature. No, that's not, uh, oh, that option is not open to us anymore. Okay. We have to maintain the climate. We have to maintain the temperature at the same level that was there in the last 10,000 years. And we have to keep it there for the rest of eternity. You know, I mean, we are the thermostat species, whether we like it or not. Thank you for that. Yeah. And does anybody know what you can put in asphalt to make it white? <laughs> uh, I mean, see, uh, solar energy comes in all kinds of, <clears throat> um, solar energy, half of it is in the infrared region. It's not even visible, okay? And half of it is in, I mean, some of it is in ultraviolet region and some of it is visible region. So based on that, you, we can figure out materials that would reflect the energy back maybe in the infrared 
spectrum or something. I mean, we have to be conscious of it. That's all we are asking. We are not saying that you know we have to put uh, uh, mirrors even on the roads <laughs> because you could then you know blind yourself while driving, right? You don't want to do that. <laughs> but we have to figure out you know uh, how to deal with it. Okay, go ahead, Shankar. Yeah, actually, I, I, I was trying to show last time Jamin something. Uh, Jamin, I just made one small presentation, okay? Just, just scraping the images from Google. But if it's okay, I can quickly present it and show like... Uh, yeah. Oh yeah, sure. Here, let, let me make you co-host. I think I have it. See if I can have a... <laughs> Okay, let me know if you guys can see the screen. Yeah. So, so what I was telling Jamin was like, I'm, I'm, I know Jamin comes like a, more like a silica, like a balls or something like thing which you can roll in the surface of the earth, depending on the sunlight concentration. Mm -hmm. I, I was suggesting him, why don't you take help from the Starlink? Because already the satellites are launched across the globe. And what I'm trying to do is like each such each satellite, you can just make some sort of holographic interaction between them. Okay, I'm not a light scientist or anything. I'm just really making a wild guess here. So if you make this, that hologram, see all I am taking this from a clouds. Okay, clouds are nothing but vapor, but when they really come over, they reflect a lot of sunlight. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, from Jim and what I understood mainly is the poles are the most vulnerable part because of the ice caps and snow and everything. So that's that's where the focus area or the, if you want to launch something. So what, what I'm trying to do is each of this, if they, they can, inter the satellite is already in the sky. If something between each satellite, if there is an interaction of lights, which acts like a fabric membrane, and that is creating a, some sort of a translucent surface looking away from the earth. From the, you're looking away from the earth, you are the sunlight. So when I see this, I'm seeing a bright, so I'm already, I'm reflecting back. So this is that when you do it at the light level, you need a power to ignite that or something, but we could take a solar or something at that level. So when you do this, even a small layer of uh, thing can be done at a large scale. There is no, nothing is done at the earth's surface. A lot of materials not involved. And uh, so I'm, I'm, both, I'm still thinking and processing this. One thing comes is how can we just do only with the light rays or a holographic effect or something? So this, uh, so this is this, this GIF animation is one of the example I'm showing. And this can be varied. Like for example, if you want to just do in the poles at the time, depending on the sun concentration, heat concentration, you can just, eliminate that holographic interaction between the Starlink satellites that will create a reflective light or it appears like a translucent bright surface. So that area gets a shape. So thereby the heat is not uh, bouncing into the surface of the earth. Yeah. yeah. So, so <laughs> the concept here is what, there is a satellite already here. How can you make an interaction between the satellite using a holographic light which acts like a light membrane and which is reflecting the sunlight. So, so I'll stop share. Like, yeah. No worries. Is that your theory, Shankar? Or is it like, are you talking about, are these your pictures? I just I took it from the, uh, like a Google search from other thing. To, to give an idea, like, to give an idea. reflecting a hologram, a hologram reflecting light back into space? Yes. Yes. That's what they're demonstrating. Yes. Uh, this picture is about Starlink. They are showing how they have a coverage. Okay. So I'm taking that picture and saying like, uh, what if we interact between the satellites as a surface with, a, uh, actually we are, we are going and what do you call the other way to say is like, uh, uh, the hermit crab or something they say. So we are asking satellite, can you allow us to do the uh, to keep our device, which, which will interact between all your satellites. Eventually it is creating a thin membrane which will reflect sunlight. So these are the uh, laser nerds that made this this uh, 3D image here. So you, need to get, you need to get in touch with them, right? 
<laughs> yes, we can ask them. I mean, uh, these are all like people have put this concept together, but this is, uh, what, do you, what do you say? This is, in this picture, actually they're explaining how the Starlink satellite gives you coverage mm. of, about everything they're explaining. Yeah, but I'm just using uh, something, taking that picture to uh, convey to J-Man or say like, a, hey, this is what I was, see, if you see this blue area, assume you have, you already have like a web-like thing here. Each, this white dots here are like the satellites. If you could make them illuminate or uh, create, then probably we would have something like this. And this is a brighter surface. Now this can reflect back the sunlight, I assume. I don't know. I'm just assuming like, I'm looking at the clouds or uh, or you can take the Aurora Borealis, it just, it, it reflects or creates a bright surface, but that's in the night. But during the day, the clouds are the best example. So the, the your theoretical science is that a hologram can reflect light back into space. Now we need an engineer. Are there any engineers in the house? <laughs> yes. <A> few. <laughs> Anybody uh, well, an expert in lasers? Can a hologram reflect light? That's the such a fascinating concept, and, and I don't know why there's not a, a Google answer. <laughs> yeah, and you have yeah, tried googling, right, Shankar? Yeah, actually, two two instances I'll give you. Okay, uh, where uh, the phosphorescence in the road reflectors they actually magnify. Uh, like if you look at them, they, they are such a thin line, but they can become so thick and broad. So, and have you ever seen the, that is another example I try to give is the, um, have you ever seen those advertisements in the bus windows and everything, or even in the buildings, they have a small dot, 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 dots. This side, they act like OPEC, but this side, they can actually show the image. So that's, that, that's where some of the, it's more of an optical illusion, mm -hmm. uh, but either you can make them some surface like when they come together, they act like white, but actually there's nothing there, but they, when they are together like the, like the, what do you call the polar bear skin? <laughs> if, you, if you take it as a, a thing or the hair, they are actually transparent, but they make it appear like white. Yeah. So more, more in that sense, like I mean, if somebody with the light can explain better, I'm just artistically, I'm, I'm relating, that's all. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, thank you, Shankar. I mean, basically, we have to we have to put these options on the table and start looking at it and and uh, come together without any uh, you know hidden agenda as to how can I make money off of this. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I, I can show on the ceiling like that is one of the thing I was showing to Jamin and Ray last time. I can just show in the ceiling, Jamin, if I'm allowed. <laughs> Oh goodness! Of course, yes. Uh, see, but I, I, I have only the gadgets that I'm showing. Okay, uh, give me one second. Let me switch off the light. And, and so uh, you, you're gonna see with the, my ceiling. Okay, let me put it upstairs. So do you see? This is just a laser light. So you can imagine this is these are the satellites. You can imagine this as just a satellite. Okay, so. But what happens is if Jamin says, oh, okay, the Arctic is getting hot. Let's, let's uh, make, let's ask Elon to, what do you do? Like, uh, let's interact, let's create a membrane. So this is kind of creating a, some sort of a light thing and, and it is create, it could be some sort of a movement, but it's creating a fabric. Uh, all is um, just an interaction through light. Cause I'm worried about the chemicals. You don't want to throw something in the atmosphere, all this. So at this point, I'm only using light. I don't know what are the disadvantage of that too, but let's let's start somewhere like, so the, it, this is making interaction between this. If you see out of this, one of the lights don't move. Those are satellites, but th they are reflecting and constantly interacting between other satellites, which appears like a membrane. And in the meantime, this is happening. It is reflecting the sunlight. Are we to, are we Motion moving? blur of the, of the dots moving creates what you're calling a membrane? Uh, what is actually moving is the satellites are there, but between satellites, they are powering beam to each other. Mm -hmm. Or something attached to the satellite is powering beam to each other. This powering beam creates an illusion of a hologram or like a surface. 
and it is totally visible from outside the earth it makes like a cloud which is reflecting the sunlight Now you, you said your presentation would be a lot better if I had some music. You, you still have an added music. <laughs> okay, it has a space music. <laughs> you can Amazing. turn on the Go Vegan song. <laughs> Something with a danceable beat. <laughs> go sunlight, go sunlight. <laughs> okay, I'll switch it. I'll switch it back. Okay, yeah, yeah. So how do you happen to have lasers in your in your place? Is this an aesthetic choice? Cool. How do you happen to have lasers? No, I love lasers. I, I, you know, always I'm okay. I'm I always I'm curious about something. <laughs> so I recently got this light somewhere from this. It has a multiple. It reflects the laser in a say. I was like, okay, how it does? I want to see. <laughs> I'm just wanna you know, the gadget freak something. No lasers or what do you call optical fibers, everything else. It'd be interesting to see if you could come up with a solution that, that uses all the technology that we have existing right now and how much resistance you get because pe other people have solutions that they're trying to get funded, that they're, you know, <laughs> we have this, this corporate, this uh, capitalist mindset that a solution has to be the best, right? In order to be championed. And it all comes down to money. And as soon as money gets involved, then everybody just turns into uh, um, vicious, competitive uh, champions of particular ideas. And that means putting down other people's ideas and making sure that they don't get it. Yeah, I, I, I see. Probably this will become popular if you say, we're, we're going to advertise your product in the sky. Which is consumption and destroy the planet even faster, right? So. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I can kind of empathize where they come from when they when they're fighting. First of all, to prove that climate change is real, and they have the oil industry, which is not a, a small number of uh, of lobbyists trying to pretend that it's not real. So they they say we need a renewable energy grid. We need to get rid of this fossil fuel industry. So if anything else comes along, quite often they'll. They'll say, "Well, you're using, you're saying that what we need to do, what what we say needs to do, doesn't need to happen." The renewable energy grid. So you're using the uh, oil industry talking points. You're obviously a shill for the oil industry. You're obviously, if you're against us, you're obviously part of the bad guys. And you kind of get this mentality, and it's it's kind of weird when they when they kind of say you're using all the talking points of the oil industry. Well, maybe the oil industry is using some of the truths, you know, that uh, in a sense, like what they said in uh, Planet of the Humans, you're building another industry on top of another industry at a, in a decade where building stuff is probably not the right solution. Building less is a solution. Eating less is a solution, but nobody wants to hear it. <laughs> But just consuming less in general is, is uh, you know, from the politician standpoint, you're saying, what, not grow the economy? Next, next idea. We need economic fasting. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead, Marco. Yeah, have... Has anybody here seen the, the documentary on Netflix, Kiss the Ground? Okay, so, so you're familiar with that part. I have, have it queued up to play it if, for a few minutes. Uh, if that's okay, we can do that. So I have a question where they, they make it sound good. Um, so I'm gonna share that quick and then I, I like some response. Salish so had a had a talk with one of the executive producers uh, or the promoters of the documentary. I'll try to find a link to that recording for you. Okay. This is a good discussion. This is a supercomputer model by NASA. We're concerned of the red and purple being CO2. I want you to notice the date. That is February. March. 
Now, what are we doing, March, April? What do we do in modern agriculture in April? We are chilly. We're chilly the land. And look at the huge plumes of CO2. Look at the dates. May. Now, let's see what happens around June. Look at the colors change. Ladies now, Marco, we can't see Welcome. anything. We hear it, but we don't see anything. Oh, how are you not seeing it? Oh, I'm sorry. Maybe you didn't screen share. I didn't do it properly. I was trying to listen real intently, but then when it said, look at this, I thought. Yeah. I think Shankar's lasers were interfering with the screen sharing. Okay. There are No, I no, I lost my theory there. By NASA, we're concerned of the red and purple being CO2. I want you to notice the dates. That is February, March. Now, what are we doing, March, April? What do we do for modern agriculture in April? We are two. We're killing the land. And look at the huge clue. Look at the dates. May. Now, let's see what happens around June. Look at the colors change. Ladies and gentlemen, what is happening in June? Do you see how powerful the living plants are? Can you imagine if we had all our rangeland and all our cropland covered? The covered planet is a healthy planet. We can fix a lot of our climate issues to be bring the CO2 down into a living plant and put it back into the soil where it belongs. Agriculture. So that that was, I thought, pretty powerful as as far as uh, seeing how quickly you know that changes with the planning. Um, I'm not convinced that this is accurate by by any means because I don't trust anybody anymore. It seems like there's so much misinformation. But can you speak to this a little bit, Silish? Yeah, um, but in also in um, April and May. Uh, we are burning down stubs, stubbles of forests to maintain grazing land. So you can see these huge fires in NASA satellite on um, April, May, and also on the other side, you know, <clears throat> uh, I think November, December timeframe. So, yeah, so. Vegetation and agriculture, vegetation and breathing, the CO2 cycle is 20 times bigger than the fossil fuel cycle, right? So fossil fuel, what we are doing with fossil fuels. So which means that by tweaking that, you can actually reverse climate change much quicker than anything else. Now, Kiss the Ground is claiming you can do that with animals, with growing more animals and then moving them around and, right? Isn't that what they're doing? That's, I think, what Finian McPhee is talking about. Yeah, I, I, I'm not, not looking at, at that part of it at all because we know that's right. you know, manufactured. I, just, just the fact that, that can, can the, like, instead of plant, planting crops, I would be, say, plant, re, replanting the jungles. Exactly. You know, yeah. not, not planting crops. No. Okay. But, but, but that made it seem like, like it was just even the crops that they're planting you know, the CO2 out at a pretty fast rate. It seemed pretty impressive. If, if we could plant enough trees in a, with, you know, cutting back the, uh, the animal agriculture, uh, mm -hmm. 
if, if we could do both at the same time, cut back to agriculture, replant the forest, do we have enough time to implement it in that way? If we could cut back fast enough on those, you know, do those two things, would we still need solar radiation management? Uh, we probably still do because uh, it is in the, the Arctic is melting right now as we speak. So meaning even if we stop adding any more CO2 into the atmosphere, which is, so what we are estimating is that if we uh, go vegan and then we start sucking down the CO2 by uh, bringing back the original forests, uh, we can completely eliminate the fossil fuel emissions. Meaning we could keep the CO2 level as it is now, right? And continue the, um, the civilization, right? Now, if we do that, uh, the Arctic will still continue melting because the CO2 level is where it is now, you know? The Arctic takes time to react to what the CO2 that you put into the atmosphere, okay? So it's actually reacting to the CO2 you put like 20 years ago, right now, <laughs> right? So we have to start sucking down the CO2 to make the Arctic wake up again. So we probably have to suck it down to maybe 380, 350 parts per million, okay, before it starts refreezing again. So knowing that, we probably still need, we need to put some mirrors to, to so do soil radiation management, okay? We need, to, we need to tweak the albedo of the planet, okay? Uh, I would say at the minimum, we need to put it on all our roofs, right? So, and that's like, you know, you could change, you could reduce the reflectivity by maybe 0.5 watts per square meter. So you could probably get to 0.5 watts per square meter by just doing it on the um, built area of the planet. Go ahead, Ray. Jay might have his hand up first. I think BJ might have too. Yeah. Oh. oh, yeah, yeah, B B BJ, I think, was first. Go ahead, BJ. BJ was first. Okay, go ahead, BJ. Okay. Um, thanks for showing that, uh, Marco. The question that, I, that came to mind to me was, does everybody around the world till in May and June, you know, uh, in April and May, and does every crop grow then? It seems to me like in different parts of the world, world. I mean, he was looking at maybe the northern hemisphere. It looked like this where the things were coming. So so I just wasn't, wasn't sure that the times were actually accurate in terms of that. And it may be, but that's what came to mind that I wanted to, to yeah. bring. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, he has one explanation. There are lots of explanations for why the CO2 cycle is not uniform. It's not uniform. We know that. You know, so the certain months in the year, it's going to be a lot more emissions of CO2 from uh, breathing and uh, decay, biomass decay, and a lot less emissions, I mean, less intake from vegetation. And there are other months where it's the other way around. So overall, we know that that uh, annually is about 20 times larger than the CO2 emissions that we are doing from fossil fuels. So you should see these variations, because it's not uniform, right? Yeah, that's that's what I was afraid of. That they're using, you know, using some some science to just and ignoring other parts of it again just right. to make it look good. Thank you. I I thought it looked good, and I, I that suggests that that growing plants does have an effect on our cycle. That it's visible through these metrics. Right. I watched that documentary, and I I was like, you know hyper ready to to uh, jump on any details that uh, were wrong. And I watched the first half of it, no problem at all. I agreed with everything that they had to say. Mm -hmm. It's just as soon as they, they tried to justify using animals that I wonder where their, their uh, priorities are. Is their objective find a solution to climate change or to exonerate eating beef? And quite often it doesn't take an awful lot of questions to, to figure out that the agenda is fueled a lot by that that industry that wants to make sure that we we keep eating these cows. Are you interested in this if we're not eating the cows, right? And usually it's it's a little less uh, 
enthusiasm. Yet at the same time, there's something interesting happening here where these, these good guys, the good guys, the Al Gores of the world, the climate fighters, the heroes, are resisting this solution, They're resisting agriculture, resisting that there are, are, are plant-based uh, plant solutions to climate change, including tr growing trees back. They, they go, yeah, yeah, you can grow trees back, but we need this renewable energy grid right away. We need to stop fossil fuels. So anything that steers away from that, they're not that interested in talking about. That cycle that I was talking about where they, the, the IPCC is governments asking questions, is climate change real? And then scientists will answer climate change is real. And then they want to have specific questions about what sort of policies they can make and what sort of impact climate change is gonna have on the world and on our, 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 uh, our uh, food security. That's obviously a concern to governments. So the funny thing is they've got soil scientists that have been working with the IPCC since the beginning, but they never ever asked them, are there soil solutions to climate change? <laughs> They must be like pulling their hair out. There's guys like Bertan Lal at, at uh, um, University of Col in Columbus. He's a, he worked for the IPCC. Was he offering soil-based solutions to climate change? No, nobody asked him, right? They just said, what will be the effect of climate change on our ability to produce food in the future? Oh, it will be very difficult. Thank you. <laughs> That's all we want. <laughs> so now I think there's a chance for them to say, like in, in documentaries like this, where they, they might not, they have a truth and they're sharing the truth and they're actually on our side as far as finding a, a climate change, you know, opening this door to the conversation about can agriculture, do we need to overhaul our food system in order to, to fight climate change? But that's, that's got to be the objective, not, not can we exonerate eating cows because there has to be a solution of getting rid of this, this animal agriculture. I mean, at least the industrial animal agriculture that everybody says that they hate, but if they say they hate it, but they don't have a solution to get rid of it, they're, they're really just creating a, a boutique market for uh, whole foods. You know, the yuppies will be able to pat themselves on the back and say, I eat green meat, so everything's okay. Hey, it's that's the discourse we have. If everybody can eat, then it's not a solution at all, really. Yeah. See, but that's the discourse we have in the current system, right? So, I mean, meaning we have like a system in which um, or the prosecution argues one case and the defense argues the exact opposite case and they both want to win, you know? So the defense will studiously ignore anything that the prosecution is saying <laughs> that that is detrimental to their, their case. And the same with the prosecution. I mean, we, so this is how, this is the kind of uh, discourse we are having in the civilization. And that is not a good way to arrive at the truth. Okay, the better way to arrive at the truth is for both sides to say, listen, dudes, we are in this together. <laughs> yeah, your guy is guilty. <laughs> he did do it. <laughs> it is that industry, okay? And so, so you need neutral parties, you know, coming, coming together and saying, yeah, okay, now we need engineers, really. This is what engineers do, right? Uh, we are neutral, we, are, we tend to be neutral parties because we have to actually build the damn thing that works. So, uh, so, so that's why, you know, the story I tell about my house fire, it's illustrative of what is going on, right? I mean, the engineers in the back were really doing the right thing. But the scientists, you ask the scientists, hey, is it possible that the heater caused the fire? And say, of course. <laughs> and he's coming up with a theory for how the heater can cause the fire. <laughs> Even though the engineer is completely ignoring him, <laughs> doing what he knows is correct. So we need, you know, and this is the problem when you have um, money involved, right? I mean, so fossil fuel industry has to speak for the fossil fuel industry. The soil industry is speaking for the soil industry, whatever, right? Everybody's speaking for their own case and they're ignoring everything that will make their case weak. But unfortunately, that's the systemic discourse we have, right? So, uh, so we really need to be in a, different, in a different pedagogy altogether, in a different way of uh, having discourses altogether, okay? 
where we are collaborating. We're not competing. It's not like, you know, so there is no, there is no agenda involved. Well, the agenda has to be to, to save, to, to stop climate change. And yeah, agenda has to be, you know, for the well-being of all, you know, yeah. the good of the whole. There's, there's problems with, uh, with the, even within the vegan movement where they want to rescue animals for, a, for an ethical agenda, which is a good agenda. But so, sometimes when they encounter some of the science that, that will illustrate what needs to be done, this happened to me today. I shared a paper with somebody and said, this proves that agriculture is worse than uh, fossil fuels. And they said, but does it say anything bad about animals in particular? I said, no, it doesn't say anything bad about animals in particular. It just is, says that agriculture has a, has a bigger impact than fossil fuels. So we have to concentrate on agriculture. And once we focus on it, obviously animals are gonna reveal themselves to be the most damaging. But they said this article doesn't say anything bad about animals, so it's no of no use to me. <laughs> so, so you got to think in steps, and you, and I also had to explain that scientists measure stuff and they they uh, come up with scientific conclusions, but they don't come up with social political conclusions. Therefore, we must all go vegan, right? That's not going to be the end of the <laughs> at the end of a scientific journal. Some sociologists may say, based on what this this says. Uh, I mean, based on what the World Wildlife Fund says that uh, even a Malaysian diet, if everybody ate a Malaysian diet, which is the, one of the least amounts of meat and dairy in the world, mm -hmm. we still need 2.48 earths to, to produce that much food. That means that, that kind of suggests that we do need to have a plant-based diet globally. But that's not something a scientist would come up with. That's something a sociologist would say, therefore, now we need to... to uh, look at what the evidence says. No, that's what an engineer would do, right? I mean, see, engineer would do that because like engineers design the uh, diet that uh, Neil Armstrong and Doug Collins, they ate, right? Buzz Collins, what they ate. Engineers designed that. So they didn't say, let's go grow a cow in the, in, on Apollo 13 or Apollo 11 and then feed the engineers, slaughter a cow, you know? I mean, <laughs> no engineer would ever propose a solution like that, okay? <laughs> it's so stupid, so monumentally stupid. You would never propose a solution like that. So uh, the, we are now you know, in a situation where we are, we, it's no longer uh, this abundance that we are going and eating up, consuming, right? We have reached the limits of that, right? So now you really have to get, an, get engineers to come and say, Given these constraints, how would you optimize it? How would you create a system that works for everybody? Go ahead, BJ. Thank you, and then three cheers for that. Yeah, <laughs> we have to do it. Um, this is a, a something I would. Uh, I'm hoping that that Ray will do, and I will be glad to help. But what he did was he showed it to me. He he showed where the, what are the, the people's names in Kiss the Ground that were also in Cowspiracy, that family? Mm -hmm. He showed- Marky Guards. Marky Guards. He showed where they lived on the map, uh, on a Google map. And you see the edge of forest there. Mm -hmm. And it's so clear what they're doing is keeping the ground cleared. And so they're, oh good, we're, we're we're, re we're sequestering carbon into the soils. But right there next to them, what they're not showing is the forest that if they stopped using the cows, it would extend out and start <laughs> sequestering even more and they could exactly. have wild grasses. And so that could be a nice little clip um, that would help clarify when people are watching Kiss the Ground because this regenerative agriculture is, is going like wildfire. I mean, you know, all the Texas A&M schools and any school that has agriculture in it is like, yippee. And, but this is so clear. Thank you, Ray, for doing that. I just, I just love that you did that. And I would love to see it where I can share it with people. <laughs> and if you watch uh, Kiss the Ground, I was watching scenes and they will not even be aware of it, but they're standing in front of a field 
and there'll be a ridge of trees in the back. <laughs> a straight wall of trees. It's obvious they, they deforested up to this spot and they stopped. So they thought it, it looks great. We got all this greenery in the foreground, it's green grass and these happy animals and this stand of trees in the back. But those stand of trees are the only thing that belongs there. Okay, the rest of the stuff. <laughs> But they don't. They wouldn't even see it. And this is all I could see after after you know, focusing on that sort of thing. What was there before? Can you grow stuff there? And usually they say, well, like the, that. Uh, looking at the place where the, the market guards were in South Dakota, there was clearly spot that was a grid of agriculture. This was row cropping something, and then there was rocky terrain that gets towards this uh, towards the forest, and. That's obviously the part that they would say, well, you can't grow anything there, so you, you have to ranch it. That's the only way you can get value out of this land. You turn sunlight into grass, into, into steaks, is the, the logic, right? But you can't grow anything there? You can grow potatoes, really? Well, <laughs> one thing I know you can grow there is trees. So if we make trees a cash crop and, and get people to grow trees, we're going to grow cheese that we're just keeping in warehouses. Why can't we just grow something that's actually useful? Go ahead, Jamin. Thank you, Salish, and thanks everyone. What a great, great conversation. I want to propose a radical idea, and this builds off what you suggested, Salish, a little bit ago about citizen science, but it also builds off your career that culminated at Intel and making these amazing chips that have transformed our world. The, the radical idea, the radical concept is a citizen's intel for the planet. But what I really mean is I'm using intel as a metaphor. I'm using the chip as a metaphor. See, in order to make those chips work, you first had to model the whole thing. You designed it and then you modeled and you had all these specialists that were working on all the different logic gates and the etching and the photo masks and all these intricate things. And everything had to work not perfectly, but it had to work within it, the, the design limits right. and uh, in order for the whole thing to work. Okay, great. We need to suddenly, we need to look at mother earth with the same fine tooth comb, the same level of complexity, the same level of sophistication. And so I think this can be a story that you are uniquely positioned to tell, Silish. Okay, mm -hmm. we need to create a map, a 3D model and get the dang data and do the modeling. I've done modeling since the uh, early 90s. I studied civil engineering, environmental engineering. I worked at Bechtel in San Francisco. We would model, model, model all kinds of stuff. Modeling works, okay? Uh, but you gotta roll up your sleeves and do the hard work and get the data and spend your time coding or bolting okay. in modeling components. And instead of doing that, We've got all these lobbyists and they're arguing and they're writing books and all this. I mean, could you imagine that to resolve an engineering question at Intel, you had some lobbyist from some <laughs> supplier saying, no, you should use this chemical. No, and, and then you have all these lawyers with all these slick presidents. No, you do the experiments, you do the models and you do what will work, okay? So we've got all these different levers that we're talking about. We need to model each one. We need to get the data, the data's there. All these farmers, all these forestry folks, atmospheric chemists and everything, they're gathering just eons of the data is there. We need to put it together in, into a model. And you know, like at Intel for the chips, you would have these like walk through models where you could walk through, you know, like you're walking through the Pentagon, the different corridors and everything else and, and map the data to what's actually happening. Okay, why is it that this current is not going through this nanoscale little corridor well it's because there's this oxidation happening or because there's a resistance there that we didn't detect before if you could do that so intricately at nano scale here we've got this giant chip it's a spherical chip right called mother earth okay so silish i appoint i nominate you ceo of the citizens intel for the chip the spherical chip called mother earth okay Organize us, Silish. Organize us into teams. Organize us into whatever taxonomy makes sense for this planet. There's the obvious taxonomies of you've got oceans, you've got polar ice caps, you've got the different layers of the atmosphere, you've got emissions, you've got sequestration, you've got animal agriculture, you've got crop agriculture. 
you know, you've got mirrors, natural mirrors, accidental mirrors, like soot, um, artificial mirrors, da, da, da. you know, we need to pull an intel on this if we're going to get this chip to work. Right now, the chip is overheating, right? Mm -hmm. But we don't have CEO Silish on the case pounding his mahogany desk saying, dang it, I need these divisions in my office right now. We need to figure out why is the chip overheating, right? right? I don't want arguments. I don't want lobbyists. I want facts and data. Get the model to work or we're not going to ship these chips and AMD is going to eat our lunch. That's what you would have done at Intel. Let's do that for the planet. Yeah, I see, that's part of how we need to write this paper. The engineer solutions to science, scientists warning. We need to say that we need to demand a citizen's model that uh, is, is not influenced by vested interests that are driven by citizens for the good of the mother earth and in which there is no, you know, you can't go there, <laughs> you know, everything has to be on the table. So they're polluting like crazy. The chemical pollution is not even measured, okay? The impact of chemical pollution is not even measured. And so it's one of those question marks on the planetary boundaries. I said, what the heck are we doing? If you have a question mark on a planetary boundary. Okay. So go ahead, Marco. Yeah, you know, I think one of our biggest problems and I see it more and more every time I, I you know, we, we meet for food healers is that we don't have enough Silishes in the world, uh, you know, our our education system is, our, I think, our biggest battle right now. Is you can you can't give information that needs critical thinkers to look at it and draw a conclusion if we don't if we aren't growing critical thinkers and haven't for for decades. We totally make it so that they're not thinking, you know, and and yeah. If, if, if we if we taught critical thinking, the only thing we taught in, in the school systems, we wouldn't have all these problems now because everybody would see through the bullshit. So, so yeah, we're, you know, I'm, I'm still in for the battle, but we got to know how uphill it is. And I, and I don't know, you, 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 you don't instantly create critical thinkers out of people that have been educated for, you know, their entire life not to think critically, but to just buy, buy, buy. So, yeah, yeah I wish I was saying something more positive right now. I, I, I just, I just, you know, it's, it's, I think it's our biggest, our biggest obstacle is the lack of, of education of most of the people. It's not hard to convince a room this size of people that care and want to do the right thing and, and, and have, you know, a critical thinker like yourself. I have a new, I have a new, um, a new love of engineers since I've met you. <laughs> you oh. know, my my, my father-in-law was not the best example of an engineer. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. No, thank you. And I hope any of my rambling is, is helping right now. I'm just kind of at one of those, I just want to rip my hair out and, and, and look, you know, so I don't have any left to rip out. We got to get this done. You All got right. your beard. True, true. All right, I'm done rambling for now. I hope some nugget came out of there somewhere. No, thanks for that, Marco. Actually, we do have, you know, there is this whole um, Indian Institute of Technology entrance exam that uh, breeds critical thinkers. I mean, they, they try to at least. That was the idea behind the whole thing is to select out these critical thinkers. And so we had to go through that process of problem solving. Okay. So, they, so you, because they come up with problems that you haven't seen before. <laughs> That's how you figure out who's going to pass and who's going to fail, right? Okay. Otherwise, if you give them problems that have been seen before, people just solve them, right? Um, so yeah, and you. So this is this is why I'm seeing that the IAT people are gravitating towards what I'm talking about. Uh, you know, um, of the 35, 30 students I have in my class, uh, HUA. I think about 20 of them are from IIT. They're just um, former IIT students. 
Uh, fascinating. But yeah, it, it, you're right. It's about asking questions. It's about recognizing that uh, you're not being told the whole truth. And it's, a, it's a really a puzzle, right? There's a lot of puzzles, you know, just hidden things. People are not telling you the truth. <laughs> and you have to figure out what is the real truth, right? And, and figure out what would be your response. So this is why I said, you know, right from the outset, you know, I realized that going vegan was number one. You cannot make a mistake going vegan, right? It's, there's no, there is no bad, uh, uh, bad impact of going vegan that, whoops, I shouldn't have done that. I should have been killing an animal instead. <laughs> You'll never say that. <laughs> Go ahead, Jamin. And so, no, I, I totally agree. I couldn't agree more. And that's why we're all here um, is because that's our number one imperative. So that's kind of like this obvious thing. That's like, if, for example, if at, at Intel, you were using, you know, some bad etching chemical or something, right? And you were to say, look, for sure, for sure, we need to replace that bad chemical with this good chemical, right? But your job doesn't end there. Right. See, that's why I say we need to do a full Intel. We need to do a full thorough analysis, all the modes of failure, all the modes of overheating. We need to get it right. So Silas, you've been promoting this one obvious solution, but we need to do a full Intel analysis on the entire planet. Right, we need to raise the bar for ourselves. And then when we go to the board of directors of Mother Earth, right, we can say, look, here's the full analysis, and here and this and this and this are exactly what we need to do. Step number one, go plant based. But it doesn't end there. Right, absolutely. Step number yeah. yeah. That's no, in that's fact, my I'm, point. Let's yeah. yeah. It just occurred to me that what we are really asking for is an engineering model for donut economics, okay? An engineering model for donut economics in which everything is on the table, right? That we are looking at everything on the table and putting it together. And so, yeah, and, and donut economics fundamentally is a vegan economics. There is no, there are no slaughterhouses in the donut, donut model. <laughs> so, so we need to start with that and then say, okay, we are not measuring aerosol loading. We are not measuring uh, chemical pollution. Put people on the ground right now to start measuring it. Okay. If we don't do that, we don't have donut economics. There is no such thing as donut economics if we can't measure the planetary boundaries. You know. Well, these things that that they were saying are obvious, are obvious to us, but I think that they aren't obvious to a lot of people, and and, and they aren't haven't been made obvious because. So many of these things that we're talking about are leftovers from the industrial age where Marco was talking about education. Uh, that's an industrial mentality towards education. How do we find the good workers? And <laughs> right. we don't yeah. care if people are bullies, maybe they'll be good managers, right? So we, we don't learn the things that we need for life. We learn the things that are good for the industry, for industrialization. So everything has been about growing the economy. So ideas that don't go to grow the economy are bad. Therefore, I did a kind of a side rant about about uh, the Al Gore presentation and how they only would talk about things that are parity. We're we're now seeing parity with uh, renewables with with coal. It's past coal and it's catching on natural gas. Okay, good. <laughs> That's good. That society is starting to shift towards these things. Would you talk about them if they weren't? If, they, if you talk about them, we need to sw switch to, to renewables, even if it wasn't growing more jobs. Right. They're saying they are. there's more jobs in, in renewables, but are you not allowed to talk about it until you get to that point? Is that why agriculture is not in your, in your slideshow? Because the externalities of animal agriculture are so accepted by society that... You know, farmers don't do anything bad. There's farmers are good people, so therefore they can't do bad things. Those miners, they're 
drilling holes and there's, you know, factories with smoke coming on. They're obviously bad. They're obviously polluting. But, you know, making food is certainly benign. You got to eat. So how much is you got to eat? Uh, got an industry, an industry that you can see from outer space. So we're looking at these Google Maps of, you know, the Great Plains extend to Missouri. Well, what's it's deforested all the way to the coast, you know, it's 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 right there. There's so much uh, agriculture is just such a, a, a footprint on the planet. We just pretend it's nothing. Yeah. You know, I mean, see, in, in a given system, you're always looking for local solutions. You're looking for local, you know, what is the current, uh, you know, what is the derivative at this point? And then can I make a little tweak here? Little tweak there so that they don't upset anybody, right? That's what you're looking for, because you're stuck in the system. So this is why you need to just say we are starting another one, okay, from scratch, which is called donut economics, right? And we need to model for that, and we need to build everything, you know. So we're trans transforming from here to there, okay? And there, everything has to be on the table. And it has to be based on the truth. And you know, it has to be based on the right axioms. And so this way, I think we can get people to say, all right, you know, for that, yeah, you can go talk about the truth. Because otherwise you'll never get to the global optimum, the global sensitivity analysis. You're always looking at local sensitivity analysis, right? Uh, like the problem that's happening in India now with the farmer's law, right? They passed a farmer's law, which aim to cut out some middlemen. And the middlemen are all up in arms because they were making a lot of money. So <laughs> they're saying, wait a minute, <laughs> we're not gonna make any money with the new law. So the government is now stuck, right? You can't make laws that fundamentally change something because there are vested interests that will fight you. So you're always looking for a win-win solution, meaning vested interests should be making more money and which means you're gonna destroy the planet even more, right? So that's, this is the only solution that's allowed in the old model. So we need to start another one from scratch. It's like going from 100 megabit to gigabit ethernet. In fact, it's the same idea. We went from analog to digital, right? And at first people said, you're crazy. It cannot be done and all this nonsense. But eventually it, it, it became reality, right? And people had to switch, they switched. Uh, and they actually found that it was better than the 100 megabit, right? So, you know, um, I think that's what's going to happen here too. Uh, we just have to boldly say it has to be it's completely different. We have to start from scratch. It has to be based on the truth. And, and then we have to model it and all this stuff. And uh, we need some resources to do it. You know, it's not going to be done on a shoestring budget. And, um, and you know, and I think when we have... Um, we, see this Climate Healers Academy that we are trying to create with all this educational material that we are putting in it, you know, we can get people to actually buy into it, you know, want to come and get educated for it. And that could be a source of revenue for us to build a new model, right? I mean, I would start with the Atul Jain's model and start building up on that. You know, he's got nitrogen, phosphorus and carbon so far. So we need to now add chemical pollution. We need to add aerosol loading you know, in that model. So you're rewriting your, your paper to a degree. Yeah. You're willing to have some people co-write if they can bring some, some extra clout and in, in insight into the table. What's your dream team? Oh, my dream team for the engineering? Are your dream team uh, free from the the trappings of of uh, of society, yeah. I you would uh, donut economics. That would mean Kate Rayworth, and she uh, believe in perpetual growth, but she's got bad ideas about population. I I understand. Well, yeah. So I, I mean, this is the thing, right? So I, I, my dream team has to have some fundamental, foundational, <laughs> basics correct, which is that you know we are. We are um, part of the earth, so we belong all along. We have always belonged, and now we are going to make this transformation. So you need to have that all that sorted out, 
you know, that should be correct. And then you can have different specializations. You could be a chemical engineer. You could be a, I need a bunch of engineers really right now, more than, more than sociologists and all that cultural people. I need engineers because we need to look for a solution that actually works. And then we can, you know, we can figure out through sociology and through art, uh, how do we sell this solution, right? Go ahead, Jamin. Thank you, Silas. So <clears throat> what I have to say um, is this is some, some feedback directly for you, Silas, um, because I think you are the best candidate to really uh, lead this at a, at a global level. And I, I'm not joking and I'm not just saying that to make you feel good. Um, but it's gonna take, I think, uh, for you to elevate yourself to a degree to the CEO of this virtual Intel for Mother Earth. See, you come from a specific part of Intel, which is the vegan part, right? And if you were promoted to, to CEO of Intel, let's say in the real life, and you said, great, I'm CEO, now I'm gonna go back to the laboratory and do what I really love to do, you would disqualify yourself as CEO of Intel, because you need to be good at HR, you need to be good at marketing, you need to be good at finance and all these things. So what I'm challenge, challenging you to do uh, in a very loving way, love for you and love for the planet, love for all of us, is to elevate yourself and don't disqualify yourself by always going back to your first love, so to speak, which is veganism, okay? And, you know, so we need to, I need you to be totally objective about SRM, totally objective about modeling, totally objective about emissions. And when you talk veganism, you need to be cool as a cucumber and say, listen, according to the models, you know, I put it, and, and here's what I would challenge you to do or offer that you do, and I'm here to help, um, is put together a modeling department, but don't wait for budget, right? You're now like local hero to IIT of India, which has how many campuses, right? It's the equivalent of like several MITs boop, 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 populated all over India, right? So you have their attention. They love you. They look up to you. Say, look, I mean, I'll be your vice president of modeling, computer modeling. I'm really good at it. Really, really good at it. And, and so get me some young engineers, some young modelers, some scientists, right? And I'll deliver for you. And you say, hey, listen, you put out the call and say, look, meet Jamin, you know, I'm here every Tuesday, every Thursday, every Friday for multiple hours each day, I'll carve out whole chunks to work on the modeling, but send me the people, put out the call, you have the clout to put out the call, right? So that's, you know, that's from the modeling standpoint, put out the call for marketing, right? I can help in that area too, right? And you know, you've, you've already got a whole vegan army, right? So, you know, you'll have lots of hands going up for the whole vegan part, the whole animal part. But um, this is my, my invitation to you is elevate yourself up all the way to CEO and broaden your scope and put out the call and ask us to organize ourselves and ask us for, you know, weekly updates. Okay, modeling department. Jamin, you signed up to be VP of modeling. What you got? What are your updates? Right? And um, anyway, that's my call because who else, Silas? If not you, who? Right? But we need someone to lead this who has the cloud. And I think the Intel chip analogy is a great one. You've used so many stories from Intel. We need to pull a full Intel on Mother Earth from a modeling and engineering perspective. So with that, I'll pass the talking feather. Yeah, I, I mean, actually it's similar to the role I played at Intel, which is not really as the CEO, it's, the, it's as a systems, uh, the systems architect for the whole thing. And, and so I was drawing resources from everywhere, you know, getting the thing to work, right? Getting a project that works and people are basically listening and saying yeah you know yeah we, we need more engineers over there more engineers over here i need someone looking at the the face lock loop over there and someone looking at the a to d converter over there anyway yeah i think that's the kind of role you're asking me to do which is which is well, i'm well, suited to do that 
Well, here's the thing. You were able, you were effective at that role because you had a competent CEO of the whole company who would listen when you said, hey, we need this. The CEO yeah. would then direct the resources. The CEO would crack the whip and everyone listened to the CEO. Not everyone wanted to listen to you, but the CEO listened to you and then cracked the whip for the whole company. Right now, we have a critical vacancy in the, mm. in the Intel for Mother Earth, and it's called the CEO position. And just like, you know, Alan Mulally one day locally here in the state of Washington years ago got promoted to CEO of Boeing from vice president of engineering to CEO, and he had to grow into this bigger role. I'm suggesting either you grow into that bigger role or nominate someone for that role. But we need it right now. There's a vacancy in the in the CEO office and we can't have that. We need a CEO of, of Intel for Mother Earth and either you or or nominate someone. So. Right, right, right. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it is, uh, you know, there is, there is momentum gathering around this new solution, you know, this new way of formulating things. I mean, until now, people didn't even think that, oh, gee, we have to really transform. <laughs> Can we not tweak it here? <laughs> <All right. laughs> Do we have to start over really and another, another way of looking at things? Now, once I framed it as, you know, you, your entire foundation is false, then big, people are beginning to see it. Okay, so that's actually my next lecture I'm giving that we are in this battle of Kurukshetra, that <laughs> the, the Kaurava side is going strong <laughs> and the Pandava side has to organize now, right? I mean, the, this is the um, side that's based on the truth or the side that's based on, on falsehoods, okay? This is the battle that's going on in our own minds also. Okay, so it's each individual has to realize that, ooh, I can't be always serving my wishing child. I have to now create an alignment with my watching child. Okay, that's the story of the wishing tree. You know, yeah. I know Ray has his hand up, but I want to play off something BJ just put into the chat, which is, do we know, she asks, do we know any vegan soil scientists or, or, or soil engineers? Um, right. I was raised Catholic and it was pointed out that, oh my goodness, you know, there, there are Catholics in every walk of society. There are Catholic doctors, there are Catholic politicians, there are Catholic this, Catholic that. Same true of veganism. There are vegan atmospheric scientists, there are vegan modelers, there are vegan this and that. And Silish, you are the closest thing I've ever seen to a vegan messiah, right? For the for the planet, for the planet, seriously. So you know, the Pope could call on all Catholic engineers, and they all come running, right? You're the closest thing we have to a vegan Pope, right? So I think what we need to do, I, I think you've got way more power than than you may even want to acknowledge, um, but we need someone to rally together as BJ says, the vegan soil scientists, the vegan atmospheric scientists, the vegan modelers, et cetera, et cetera. Let's take that approach, right? Um, and let's organize. So let's let's have a weekly meeting for organization. And then mm -hmm. we can all go into breakout rooms. All right, atmospheric science, breakout room one. Soil science, breakout room two. Economics, breakout room three. Marketing, four. Politics, five, right. et cetera, et cetera, et cetera right? And wherever there's a missing, right? Put out a, a call to all vegans, you know, rattle the cages and find us, you know, the vegan oceanographers, right? Because there's nobody in, there's nobody in breakout room seven for, for oceanography, okay? And we need them now. We need you now. So I think that this, this can be, uh, I don't know if clarion call is the right word, but a if it is the clarion call to vegans, hey, listen, we need you to come together now. And it's it's right. not enough to, to not eat hamburgers and tell your neighbors not to eat hamburgers. We need to step it up and create the citizen science, you know, virtual right. Intel for Mother Earth. And, you know, I think Intel is a great metaphor. My goodness, you know, because everyone can picture this kind of everyone's seen, you know, you know, model simulations of what an Intel chip is. It, the 386 chip was probably the size of the Pentagon. The, you know, the current chip is probably the size of all of Washington, D.C., right? If not the entire Eastern seaboard of oh, complexity. No. The complexity of the chip we worked on, OK, 
Okay, back in 99, 2000, 2001 to 2003, the complexity of the chip that we worked on was larger than the complexity of every city in the world put together. <laughs> okay, so now it's the entire universe and all this, all the Martian <laughs> cities and all the cities that Isaac Asimov ever postulated. No, seriously. <laughs> so, so, so you know, that's the level of complexity we're facing, right? Yeah. I mean, that's actually way more. I mean, the the planet it's not that hard. We don't have as many layers of atmosphere as Intel has. You know, stories in the ship. <laughs> it's true. It's you know, true. really, this is an easier problem. But so you know, it'll take a fraction of the Intel to do it. But we still have to put it together. Oh yeah, yeah. Right? No, no. I mean, I think even even now, you know, uh, the ISAM model that uh, um, Atul Jain runs in uh, University of Illinois needs supercomputers. I mean, lots of supercomputer time from, you know, uh, San Diego, he was, <laughs> and it cost him a lot of money too. So that's why he was looking for money so he can do his simulations. Yeah. Uh, but you're right, well, uh, Jane. you know, actually it reminds me that Jane Wellers Mitchell and Anita Krang and I had a meeting talking about how to organize vegans, exactly like what you're talking about. <laughs> You we were going to do an app to get vegans to come together. Okay, but but before the app, let's let's get on uh, Jane Unchained again, and now mm -hmm. let's put out the Clarion call, and let's say, listen, we meet every week. You pick the day and time, Silish. This is your meeting, mm -hmm. right? I'm I'm signing up for duty. I'm reporting to duty, and I know Ray is, and I know BJ. Everyone in this room is is is, is reporting for duty, right? Mm -hmm. And we need you to lead us, Silish. You, yeah. You've got all the skills you need, every skill. You've got leadership, everything, storytelling, everything. Lead us, Silas. Lead us. Thank you. Yeah. Go ahead, Ray. I was going to spoil that and be, play the devil's advocate. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, how does veganism fit into this? Because veganism, in a sense, is a stated bias. When it comes to um, when it comes to science, because the veganism isn't a science. So, what veganism to me represents in this in this uh, context is the ability to uh, I call it take off the meat goggles, see the world from the point of view of somebody who isn't desperately in love with animal agriculture and its products, right? It's the removal, in, in that sense, it's a removal of a bias rather than a bias. It is a bias in itself. And veganism itself, by definition, is an ethical uh, and uh, compassionate uh, lifestyle. So that, that means that you, you really can't be removed from that bias. And the devil's advocacy I wanted to play was uh, there's a guy that has a website called Counting Animals. Uh, his name's Harish, and I asked him if I, I was doing research to try to figure out how many animals a, a vegan saves compared to a vegetarian. He says the difference isn't that much because uh, you're uh, you're measuring death, right? You're not measuring suffering. You're measuring how many animal lives do you save. So you, every egg has to be, uh, you know, over the life of that hen divided by two because that hen probably had a brother that was macerated it at birth. So the, the math of, of modeling the difference between vegetarianism and, and uh, veganism isn't that, isn't that different. And I know that, that uh, when you model things like a, a shift to a, a, a vegan diet, it doesn't show up that much because the, the biggest shift you know, are the people that eat a ton of meat to the people that eat a lot of meat, you know that 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 crazy eating tons of it to eating a, a bunch of it. It's a, a, a graph that goes like this, flattens out, and then it, then there's the vegans at the end that don't eat anything. So that sliver of fall off, these people that eat a ton of meat, to the people that eat just a little bit, is a big is the biggest ramp. So you actually, if you're counting, if you're modeling it it doesn't make that big of a difference. And people always point at this and say, you don't have to be vegan for there to be a big impact on the environment. And they're right. But 
that removal of bias is so important because otherwise you're going to be making your judge, every judgment is going to be, how do I keep eating animals, right? So you, you start to do all the math in the way that the IPCC does, the way the FAO does the math, and the way the IPCC lets the FAO do the math, <laughs> that in itself is a, a critical, like a grievous travesty to the scientific method. You don't let the industry measure itself. So, I mean, they aren't vegan, but because they are the opposite of vegan, they are harnessed. That is a bias in itself, and it's a, a more dangerous bias more dangerous than anything because it's an invisible bias. They assume because they are the status quo that they don't have to, they don't have a bias. They just have the majority of numbers and there's no, there's no such thing. That's a bias. It's just a, a very popular bias. Yeah, I, I so would say that is, is the removal of that. Right. I would actually say, put it, I'll frame it a little differently, Ray. I would say that um, what we are looking for is people who, who reject the axioms of the current model. The two axioms of the current model, which is the pursuit of happiness is best accomplished by stoking and satisfying a never ending series of desires. And that life is a competitive game in which the strong can possess, enslave and exploit animals, nature and the weak for the pursuit of happiness. Those two axioms have to be rejected by people who work on this model, this new model. And that turns out Vegans, I mean, veganism is a is like a bare minimum <laughs> of a re, of that rejection, right? And <clears throat> so you're looking for happiness within you, and you are saying that you are not there to exploit people, exploit other things. You are here to serve, right? So those two things have to be have to be bought into. If you're still eating meat, you haven't bought into it. You still, you still think it's okay to enslave and exploit the weak for the pursuit of happiness. Because why are we doing it? You know, it's not, you don't need it. Well, so many people are gonna say the pursuit of happiness is reserved for humans. So there's, and this is part of the thing about the donut economics, those people to, to leverage those people out of the middle of the donut, there's a lot of um, anthropocentric inertia to get to, uh, these people must be saved at all costs. It, and that means eating animals. That means treating animals like they, that they're not, they're nothing more than a resource. Right, yeah. So how do you overcome this anthropocentrism? And I think that's one of the things that veganism liberates you of is, mm -hmm. is this uh, state of, well, obviously if it's good for a human, it's good, right. period. No further right. explanation required. And a lot of scientists are gonna be in that mindset. So it's, it's gonna be a tough, a tough job. Um, can we find scientists that are that are fully vegan? And if lacking that, can we find scientists that are not beholden to the to the economic structure of of science? That's always been the problem with science: is that science doesn't get done unless somebody funds it, and nobody funds it unless there's there's a commercial interest. Yeah, so that which is why you don't have big broccoli; you just have big meat and dairy and uh, special interests funding science. Yeah, it really, we can, is, you know, it has to be some uh, academic institutions that get involved in this because there's a lot, lot of uh, research work that needs to be done. You need a lot of young people working on it. And uh, uh, among the nations I know, um, I would say India is the one place where academic research is funded mostly by public money. Very little by, you know, uh, private interests, <laughs> which is what's happening here, right? So uh, it's, it's easier to get professors looking at this, you know, dispassionately there. So I'm, I'm sort of, Maybe this is why it is gravitating the way it is gravitating. You know, I mean, I really believe that Mother Nature is much smarter than we give her credit for, and that she's working something here, some magic here that <laughs> we're not seeing, but we are slowly beginning to see it, right? So she's working this magic, it's happening in front of our eyes. So she's putting these things together, right? And um, 
getting us all together on Zoom, <laughs> sending a little virus so that we get on Zoom. <laughs> instead of trying to get to you know everyone get to phoenix to talk about things <laughs> so i i think there is some magic being worked now you know that we don't see that we are, that we are seeing okay i'm not saying we don't see we are seeing it and um so i i said trust the process and keep at it and never give up um because there are lots of there are lots of lives that are dependent on us not giving up and uh, and i'm um actually i wanted to announce something else there was the interfaith vegan coalition has this award called homo ahimsa award you know about that bj did you hear about it too were you part of that group that nominated me you were <laughs> okay so they called me today and they said they decided to award it to kimaya and i kimaya and me together it's not just me it's both wow <laughs> so we are the homo himself the first homo himself award recipients and uh, so that's going to be announced i mean that's going to be uh, ceremony is going to happen next week wow yay 21st yeah and i thought that was great they did it that way you know it's, it's just both of us um together because to me she is my krishna you <laughs> know she is the one who's directing the chariot you know i'm just following along saying okay tell me what to do <laughs> wow and so often we're we're following this kind of um we're following this kind of chariot that we don't really know who's who are going to be the leaders of this world that will be inherited but we know that their their values are going to be a lot closer to ours than the people running the show right now so yeah i think uh, who was it i, I think uh, ingrid had the right idea in the morning when she said uh, we are all called to become children again not men and women we, we need children with the with the innocence and the unselfishness of children the uncontaminated mind of children with the knowledge that you have already acknowledged right so you accumulated you know so with the engineering knowledge the scientific knowledge you don't just dump it all out and say <laughs> i don't know whether one plus one is two or not <laughs> right so start with that but have the same innocence and um openness and uh, unselfishness and wonder that children have you know uh, the wonder you know at that something is being revealed to you actually you're being guided by mother nature right that she wants this to happen she wants us to uh, get on the right path okay she's she's put us in our rooms to think about what we have done now she's saying okay now wake up and now build this new thing <laughs> and she's she's putting it all together i mean putting us all together come on right she's doing an awesome job so with that wonder i think we will we will we will be in the right position to to come up with solutions go ahead jayman and then marco and then Thank i you. have to retire all right very good so um with what you just said here's here's my idea so now i've identified two vacancies and i've got two nominations i still want you as ceo uh i want my i nominate kamaya to be chairwoman of the board or chair child of the board and she's the one you report to but we need someone pounding the table saying are we going to you know ship this new chip by spring are we going to cool the planet on time and stop extinction what's your plan and put it to me in terms that are simple and clear don't mm -hmm. give me a bunch of goggly gook with equations with partial derivatives and no 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 are we going to ship it on time are we going to cool it on time and are we going to stop the massacre on time what's your plan and you need to have a plan that's that's airtight mm -hmm. or you know she might fire you so um anyway that, that those are my nominations but really let's get on chain on chain because now with, two, with the two of you nominated let's get on chain on chain 
and put out the clarion call. Yeah. Vegans, yeah. wake up. We need you here. With that program and your and your recent award and Kamaya, I mean, come on. We've got what we need to do this. Let's pull the trigger. Jane Unchained, it's that simple. When we did our last Jane Unchained program, boom, Sarah stepped up. Now we've got Ingrid. Now we've got Food Healers LA. When we do Chain mm -hmm. Unchained, the world changes. So let's change the world again. Okay. That's my clarion call to all of us and you in specifically. I'm putting you on the hot seat, Silish. If we're not on Jane Unchained again next week, I'm not going to be a very happy shareholder. Let's put it that way. <laughs> yeah. All right. I passed the talking feather and uh, Marco has his hand. Go ahead, Marco. Yeah, I, I just I just have a, a little a short rant here and it might be silly and maybe it's not. <clears throat> Real quickly, we, we all agree words have power, right? I have been on, this has happened to me lately, I'm kind of on this kick when people say, I want to play devil's advocate. The thing that comes in my head is why the hell would you want to be the devil's advocate? Why can't we be the angel's advocate or humanity's advocate or earth's advocate? Can, can we change that? You know, <laughs> does that make sense at all? Yeah. And, and that's it. That's that's. It's kind of setting people up to say what's coming, coming out of my mouth next is going to sound pretty demonic. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm advocating because I'm not actually a demon or a, or a devil. I, I just, uh, just for the get, sake of conversation. Yeah, I just always get that. It, it, it's like you would. I think people would start listening with, like you said, it, it does get the attention when you say that. You know, people listen a little more, maybe. But, you know, we're also. And you remember that I w I'm actually arguing something that maybe I don't actually believe myself, which is important because I remember high school. Uh, right debate in which uh, one of the, the uh, people I was debating against was like ready to kill me. And I was like, wait, wait, remember I was <laughs> forced to debate something that I actually didn't represent in the first place. <laughs> that, that, yeah. Yeah, I don't know, something to think about. That's all, all right, thanks. <laughs> uh, it reminds me of, uh, I think uh, there's a movie called Injustice for All with Al Pacino. And uh, at the end, basically he's the defense attorney for someone who's obviously guilty. And then um, the prosecutor was trying to convict the guy who was guilty, but, and so Al Pacino goes up and he says, look, you know, I'm supposed to be speaking for this guy, but I'm telling you, he's guilty. <laughs> <laughs> he needs to go to jail right now. <laughs> And they and they actually dragged him out of the room because he was not following the rules. <laughs> Go ahead, BJ. Oh, thank you. Um, I was just thinking about, and I can't remember now what in the conversation reminded me of it, but the drawdown group hmm. and how they're not, how I have not heard them talk about the Faustian bargain. You know, they have their overall thing is food, but. Uh, they're doing that, and I would like another word for shotgun approach, but okay, I'm going to turn off my water faucet. Well, I have no idea whether that'll fix it or not, mm -hmm. so they have all these these ideas out there, and regenerative farming is one of them, and I, I can't be on their side uh, the way I'm hearing it, and I know, Ray, you, you work with them, so you know better what their training is, and Elizabeth went through it and everything, but I'm thinking in terms of engineer modeling and trying to get things crystal clear so we know that hey yeah it would be good if you uh you know uh let's see compost it. it it is good if you don't use plastic bags but will that solve climate change which is what the whole purpose is i mean that's not the whole purpose there's all kinds of good things we need to do but anyway i just wanted to to bring that that's one of the little things that i <laughs> wonder about because yeah. people are going to be coming up with, again, like somebody else I know who said, oh, yeah, I went to the drawdown thing. Okay. Right. Where, where, what are you going to work on now? <laughs> Actually, I like Jamin's idea of formalizing into a model for engineering, for uh, donut economics. So then you're looking at all the planetary boundaries, not just climate change, right? 
And you're not, and you're also modeling and you're quantifying the impact of everything you do. So Drawdown is saying, yeah, this could do this, this could do that, but only in, with respect to climate change. They're not looking at anything else. So it's still in the old linear model, uh, linear idea of, you know, you need to solve this problem first, forget the rest. <laughs> He said, no, 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 you can't forget the rest because that's going to kill you too. <laughs> right? In fact, ultimately, it's about, it's about life. Right? Is it killing life? This is why biodiversity loss is the biggest violation of planetary boundaries. It's violating by a factor of a thousand. Not by 30%, by a factor of a thousand. <laughs> so. I went to a Toronto drawdown meeting last week, or earlier this week, I should say. And I had the screen up the whole time. I didn't. I didn't engage an awful lot, but I mean, this is a, a graph that they had in their old website. It's not there anymore, but it compares the impact of all the different sectors. Mm -hmm. So the food sector blows away all the other sectors. Any two of them combined. And then uh, we broke into groups and we talked about solutions. So. I talked about about veganism, and somebody said, "Well, I think that I think we'll be able to uh, to uh, have urban gardening." So I said, "Like rooftop gardening and stuff like that." Um, so that'll be vegan, of course. And he goes, "Well, no, it doesn't have to be." I said, "You're going to keep a, a a dairy cow on top of your roof and feed them your vegetables that you grow on the roof." And he goes, "Well, no, maybe rabbits." I said, "You're going to have rabbits in your garden on your rooftop." So there's this this idea. You just have these these catchphrases like rooftop gardening, and everybody goes, "Yeah, okay, Toronto will be able to to feed itself in the in a case of an emergency." And I said, "Man, I thought I thought people said that vegans hate farmers. You're going to cut the farmers out of the system and say, no, it's okay. Toronto's got us all the food they need. Too bad, guys." But it's this kind of attitude that there's these uh, buzzwords. Therefore, this problem is is easy to solve. Right. Yeah. And it, it's really kind of hard in this kind of, uh, you, you mentioned earlier about solving things at the local level. And I was having such a hard time trying to, to apply things locally. And I know this is something that we have to do. Think global and act local. But when it comes to local solutions, um, the systems are hard to change one system at a time. But I guess, the, I, mean, I mean, looking farther than the food healers solution to try to uh, prove that a model works in one community will make everybody else go, wow, that works. I want it in my community. And then that's right. how it grows. Right. And, and you don't need any sort of uh, federal program to, uh, to make it work. You don't have to uh, catch the attention of the people at, at the highest up that really don't want to feed everybody. They just want to make sure that they, uh, they get reelected. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Um, wonder why they took that one down. That... And it was hard to find on the original website. Now it's not there at all. <laughs> because they want, and that was kind of how that conversation went was, we have all these different solutions, 80 different solutions so everybody just choose which one they like. <laughs> like, I can't design buildings. <laughs> I don't think there was an architect there. And uh, um, I mean, you could influence architects to be as green as possible, but what would you, how much energy would you put into that campaign to influence architects when it's, I can't even read it, but it's one of these little ones. You got to get go for the main ones, and when you look at the uh, the drawdown list, they've got the sortable list. The top five solutions are going to eclipse all the rest of them. So yes, there's a, a bunch of things that we got to focus on, and if you happen to be an architect, be a green architect. But other than that, be a vegan green architect. <laughs> I wanted. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Shankar. You're muted. You're muted, thank you. I'm sorry. <laughs> one of the drawdown events I attended, like there is a one is taking a cow for a walk in the seashore so they can eat the algae. 
<laughs> and the person who was, who was explaining was convincing me. I was like, <laughs> I felt the rooftop, rooftop, my, my rooftop. <laughs> <laughs> the cow will probably just barf it out. It never eat that. <laughs> well, apparently they are feeding cows seaweed, and it and it reduces the amount of emissions that it reduces the <laughs> amount of uh, methane that they they eructate. But <laughs> that's these sort of things. Like I, I could actually see them being a transitionary solution if we need to get. You know, go on all 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 uh, guns burning and and just get the uh, carbon solutions in place. So people are still eating beef at this time. So we we don't have an immediate solution. So at least they could be as sustainable in the meantime. But it always 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 translates into an agenda where you exonerate cows and now cows are fine. So we can still consume cows and that's it's it's not a problem. I don't know what the word is for it, but it's, you know, it's kind of fallacy that you just kind of, uh, by association, um, prove that, that there is a, a sustainable cow somewhere in the world. So the one that you're eating is, is uh, exonerated by association, <laughs> even though it was grown in a factory farm with, or uh, even worse for the climate impact, grass fed, because the grass fed are, are uh, have more of a climate impact. The, the word you're looking for, Ray, is bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> it was right there. Go ahead, BJ. Okay, thank you. One time, I, I know you're getting ready to leave, but I want one time somebody asked you about drawdown and the amount of carbon that they had done or something, and you said, well, they didn't, they didn't um, use I don't remember what the whole set of cows or <laughs> yeah. I didn't, do you remember what that is about? How, how not only does it show that they're the most now they didn't even get the bigger picture. Yeah. They, they never considered hundred percent elimination of animal agriculture. Number one, uh -huh. they just said, okay, 50% reduction. What the heck does that mean? You know, if you, if you can get it down to 50%, you should be able to get it down to hundred percent. Right get it to 100% reduction. And, uh, and then I don't know if they consider the opportunity cost correctly. Okay, right. not many people really consider the opportunity cost. It's because it's what do you do with that land, right? And that, and there are, you know, like even uh, Atul Jain in his models, he's looking at what will, uh, what will happen on that land as it, as it has been degraded today. As if we are, we don't have the ability to go and intervene and make things better. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Once right. polluted, it stays polluted. Excuse me, you know, uh, it's so. These are all the kinds of things that we need to overcome, because I don't want models like that. I want people to say, okay, what can you do on that land? If you could put put your best efforts into it, what can you do on that land? So clearly, you can bring back the original forests. Right? If you can't bring back the original forests on land on Earth, how are you going to create new forests in Mars? <laughs> Which they're happily talking about doing, right? <laughs> because there are billions of dollars that Elon Musk has. He's been giving it to them. <laughs> so those are all the biases we need to get rid of, you know, and we need to start being honest and I mean, start looking at things um, based on what we can do. And then of course, then you have, to figure, you have to figure out how are we going to do it? If it's necessary, how are we going to do it? And that paper that was, didn't have it, anything bad to say about animals. It actually did say that uh, animals are obviously going to be the biggest impact. Uh, and their solutions were to uh, figure out how to um, you know, all these little tweaks to make them uh, less of an impact. And then Amos as an afterthought, they said, and maybe we should try to convince people to eat less of it. <laughs> and I would point to this out. I said, this is actually a breakthrough because the rest of the FAO, every paper you read, they go, we're going to see a doubling of the demand for meat, especially <laughs> from, from developing nations. And we have no idea how we're going to meet that demand. <laughs> 
meet that demand? You just explained how bad it was. Why would you ever try to meet that demand? Right. Because they just understand things that, well, if somebody wants, if a human wants something, they should get it, right? This, this anthropocentric privilege of if it's good for a human, therefore it's good. And you have right. to, it, you know, the externalities of, of impact on the environment and, and anything that might uh, happen to the animal itself, like be bred into a meaningless existence and suffering and death. All that is, uh, I mean, that's what we have to fix. Same thing that we can't fix the, uh, we can't boycott to, to, to uh, save the, the rainforest unless we value the rainforest as rainforest. We'll deforest it for absolutely anything. Golf courses or to grow <laughs> grass or grow sod for, for, for cities. Anything that's worth more than a, than a rainforest, that means we'll get rid of it. All right, guys. Thank you very, very much. It was a great discussion, as always. Congratulations on all your good news. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Thanks for looking up. <laughs> and better news coming. We, we're going to put out the clarion call next week. I'll, I'm going to recap for Sarah because uh, she answered the last clarion call. So anyway, <laughs> but Silas, you're, you're off the hook. Have a great weekend. And we're, we're back on it next week. Wonderful. Yeah. Er, early next week, because it's going to be a big week. Actually, tomorrow there is a dairy out panel. So if you want to join us, join us for that. It's, I think, at uh, 10 o'clock my time. Well, after a super busy Thursday and Friday, I've got family obligations. But send me the link, please, if, if you will, and I'll uh, I'll see if I can join. But um, Yeah, it, there's an event on Facebook. It's, it's 9 a.m. Uh, Pacific time tomorrow. If 10. you email me the link, I'll, I'll, I'll see if I can do it. But anyway, but, right. but remember what we talked about. I'm sure you will. And next week, we got to get on Jane Unchained and put out All the right. clarion call. All yeah. right. All right. <laughs> Thanks Talk so much, Silas. Have, have a great weekend. Bye-bye. See ya. All righty. Welcome back, Sarah. Um, I'd, I'd love to recap for, for Sarah and, and, uh, and everyone. So uh, what we talked about with Silish is um, that we need to do a thorough analysis of all the solutions that we need, and it has to be objective, and um, be and it's not just focused on our favorite solution, the plant-based solution, but we have to consider all the solutions and all the possible levers, including solar radiation management, including you know emissions, including um, you know economic solutions, including food solutions. Right? Food solutions is easy because it maps straight to plant based, and so we all get up and cheer, right? But basically, if we're going to be convincing to the world, um, we need to both appear and actually be completely objective. Now, we happen to know in advance, um, you know, like those math books in high school where the answers are in the back of the book. We went ahead and looked in the back of the book and we saw the answer said, yes, plant-based. So we happen to know the answer before we, you know, objectively work through the problem. Um, but we need to appear to the world and we need to be for the world objective. Right, so, so what's the clarion call? The clarion call is we need to put together a planetary team. My uncle Frank is joining because he just called. We, have, we usually check in at night. I said, Uncle Frank, get on here because we're, we're having a good meeting. So let me welcome Uncle Frank real quick. Uncle Frank, wait, he's connecting to audio. Uncle Frank. Welcome back. Hey. All right. I've got it now. Not All right, Uncle Frank. So I'm just I'm I'm recapping so you're 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 right on time and you'll I think you're going to love what I'm about to say. So we need to put together a planetary team um staffed by scientists like my uncle Frank. Hey Uncle Frank. Uncle Frank's a physicist. 
uh, engineers like myself and Silish and my dad, my uncle Frank's brother. Um, and by all myriad specialties, right? So that we can do a thorough, complete, objective analysis and modeling uh, across all the planetary boundaries, right? Not just heat and biodiversity, but you know, chemical pollutants of all different kinds and populations and this and that and everything, whatever, a complete thorough uh, analysis, modeling, and ultimately design of the solutions, right? Now we happen to know in advance that the design is gonna include no animal agriculture. We already know that. Um, and part of the, uh, but the, the complete clarion call uh, is that we need to come up with the entire design, not just the no animal agriculture part, not just the vegan part, but it'll include the SRM part, solar radiation management. It'll include the food healers part, feeding everyone. It'll include the economics part, which may involve new currencies, a new mode of production for the global economy, uh, certainly different from this endless hoarding <laughs> mode of production uh, at, at all costs to the planet and to people and to everything else. Um, so the clarion call that we talked about that I'm now super fired up about is that uh, we put out a call to the entire vegan community, right? Because the vegan community is the community that really most gets it and is most objective, right? If you're a meat eater, you look at vegans as like some weird religious sect that's the least objective. But if you're vegan, you look at vegans as the most objective and the meat eaters are this weird, you know, um, omnicidal sect that's just out to just slash burn and kill everything so they can get their next bacon cheeseburger, right? So the clarion call, the initial clarion call is to the entire vegan community that says, listen, we need the vegan physicists, we need the vegan engineers, we need the vegan marketers, we need the vegan politicians, we need the, you know, across the board so that we can put together the vegan planetary team to address every aspect of the complete model leading to the complete design, the thorough design of all the solutions that go way beyond the vegan solution. Yes, they include the vegan solution, but also go beyond it. SRM is not exactly a vegan solution. BJ articulated it well. Hey, you know, I, I think I need to kind of open my mind a bit more because it sounds a bit artificial and, you know, she would prefer to think of it as just, you know, hey, everybody eats plants and peace, love and, and plant-based and everything will be great. But, you know, we have to be willing to go beyond, right? So the clarion call is to vegans and it's to get together to do the complete modeling and analysis and ultimately complete design of all the solutions, not just the ones that immediately appeal to all vegans. Anyway, that's my brief recap. And I pass the talking feather for any questions, comments, objectives, ob objections, criticisms, et cetera, et cetera. Hey, David, a question. Yeah, you yeah, mentioned yeah. about modeling. So is it like, it will be like a super set of modeling or like how do you bring in like, like we segmented the areas or? Yeah, yeah. So let, let me put it this way. You, you saw Star Wars, the original Star Wars, right? Okay. The final 15 minutes of the Star Wars movie, my uncle Frank still didn't see Star Wars. You got to see, that's your homework for this weekend, Uncle Frank, is watch the original Star Wars. Hey, better, for, you know, better 40, 43 uh, years late than never. Okay. So the, the, the original Star Wars, the final 15 minutes, and everyone else in the room knows exactly what I'm talking about. They started this way. The, the data, I, I, can, I can quote it. 
the data that uh, Princess Leia retrieved, you know, and from the R2 unit uh, showed it was a it was a complete model of the Death Star, right? All the complete you see it on the on the screen there, and that complete. An, an analysis of the data from the R2 unit retrieved by Princess Leia, whatever, um, uh, shows that there's a weakness. And therefore, if, you know, if a photon torpedo is shot right into the exhaust port, it'll start a chain reaction that'll blow up the Death Star, right? And um, so that, what, what that resulted in was the, the design of the attack that the red team and the gold team, you know, with Luke Skywalker and everybody else, that led to the design of the attack. So then they designed the attack, they executed on the attack, you know, some good guys got shot down, there were some failed attempts, but ultimately Luke shot the photon torpedo through the exhaust port, kicking off the chain reaction and blew up the Death Star exactly as designed but before they could design the attack they first had to model have the model of the death star we need that kind of model but not for this death star but for mother earth we need a model we need a complete holistic model i happen to be pretty darn good at modeling right uh computer modeling i did it at berkeley i did it at bechtel i did it at mit I, I've, I've done it throughout my career. And it's about taking the facts and taking an understanding, in this case of the physics, thank you, Uncle Frank. So we need the Uncle Franks of the world to give us the, you know, the scientific equations, right? And then the Jamins of the world will code them into code and put them into a computer model and we'll have a Death Star-like model of Mother Earth. And then we can say, okay, now that we've got this model, now we can run scenarios, right? Now we can say, okay, what if, you know, what if we eliminated all animal agriculture, right? And just returned all these, you know, this huge percentage of the Earth's surface back to nature. What if we stopped all commercial fishing? What if we reduced all emissions, right? And we can run these what if scenarios Uncle Frank says no, and I welcome you to chime in, Uncle Frank, and say what you're saying no to, because <laughs> I've said quite a lot. Don't eliminate um, the fish. Wait, wait, Uncle Frank, you, you need to unmute and then talk. It, did. it, did. Then, it said yeah. unmute. It's, don't eliminate okay. the fish. So. Okay, uh, Uncle Frank likes to eat fish, so you're about to get a bunch of vegans in your face because there's a bunch of vegans in the room here. So yes, we got to eliminate them. Anyway, but to get it, but let's go back to objectivity. We can run these what if scenarios, okay? And see what if, what if, what if, what if, right? So you start with a model, you run a bunch of simulations, a bunch of what if scenarios, and you, you know, just like any, meeny, miny, mo, you pick the very best one, the one that can, that will lead to the best, outcome, right? And if objectively we can show that the best solutions include eliminating animal agriculture and doing this much SRM, okay, humanity, you can't argue with the, I mean, you know, people from the oil and gas industry, people from the meat industry, et cetera, will argue it. But if we have an airtight model right, if we have the most objective model possible and we say, okay, show us what part of the model is wrong or what model are you using? And then we'll show them which part of their model is wrong, but we need to become the modeling experts, right? How do we do that? You know, instead of waiting, we, we don't have 10, 20 years to write grants and wait and wait and wait until we get funding for this and do it through some university. We need, that's why I'm saying, let's put out the clarion call to the entire vegan community and say, look, all hands on deck, um, but and with a particular, um, not a particular, I was about to say with a particular emphasis on scientists and engineers, but the scientists and engineers and computer scientists are just needed for the modeling part. We need vegans across the board from PR to marketing, to political science, to lobbying, 
you know, to entertainment, to art, right? To, you know, to, to, to do this right. So the clarion call is for all vegans to get on board and let's put together a virtual organization, including citizen science, citizen engineering, citizen marketing, right? The food healers part alone is a huge part, right? We need to create a whole massive planetary organization just for that, right? Right now, LA is leading the charge and Sarah and Ingrid are leading the charge within LA. God bless both of you. Um, and, uh, but we need to do this across the board. Science, engineering, modeling, you know, ultimately marketing, art, entertainment, you name it. We need all hands on deck. Let's all come together and under the appropriate leadership in this case, Dr. Silas Rao, Kamaya, et cetera, et cetera. Ray, I think you've got very important parts, roles to play in this because you helped put together the whole, um, you know, base camp, et cetera, et cetera. That's a huge part. That's a huge part of this, right? So Ray, you got your next lament. assignment. It, huh? You're making me a lament how all the study groups are pretty much stopped now. Because <laughs> that was, I was thinking, we were doing all those things. Right, right, but see, but now, now we've got, we've got. I think we, we've clarified the clarion call, right? Now there's an objective. What's the objective? The objective is blow up the Death Star. In this case, it's save Mother Earth, not blow up a sphere, but save a sphere, <laughs> right? But it, but it maps to the final 15 minutes of Star Wars, right? We need a model, right? Before we can save the planet, we first need to model it and then run all these different scenarios, come up with the optimal holistic design that spans everything from human diet to transportation to the economy itself, right? A, a new game, a new mode of production for the economy. Right now, we're still playing the old game of monopoly from 1934. Accumulate as much monopoly money as you can and Whoever has the most hotels and wads of Monopoly money wins and everybody else starves to death. You know, how's that working out for us? Not very well, I'd, I'd posit. Okay, what new game? Well, Silas says Homo Ahimsa, da 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 See, right now we've been, we've been leaving it all up to the Wizard of Oz, the Wizard of Silas to come up with everything. We need to, like he said, start with a blank slate and get all the facts, all the data, model it all, run the simulations and come up with the best solution. Yes, BJ. I was recently looking at some ecological data. I mean, some, some conclusions and trying to look up and seeing how long it would take for um, a forest to die because I've been hearing that in five, you know, we just have if you if you use up five percent of or twenty percent of a forest, then it uh, changes everything when you get to that certain point. And what I got out of all of that was that it takes a long time to gather the data. I mean, they did a twenty year study to see what happens. Um, and so yeah, it, so I'm all for gathering data and building a model. But you know, we had the twenty twenty six when we're going to lose all mammals, so we. You know, we, unless we change something with the World Wildlife Fund's um, data indicates that. Uh, we do need more data, but we have to have, like you, I think you may have said, a deadline on it. Let's see what we can gather in a year. Well, you can't do a whole lot of things in, in, a, in a year, maybe. Anyway, I'm wondering about that aspect. Yeah, here's the thing, here's the thing. Rather than, you know, if we want perfect data on how long it'll take for all the forests to die, all we have to do is just wait for all the forests to die and then we'll have perfect data, right? Um, <laughs> that would kind of defeat the purpose. So, but, but the good news, uh, BJ, is we've got decades, in some cases, centuries of, 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 of data, right? Forestry has been around for a long time. So we've got a lot of data. We have to do the best we can with the with the data that we have. We'll never have perfect data. We will never have a perfect model. Um, but you know, just like with the invasion of Normandy, 
you know, at some point they had to launch the ships, hit the beaches, and yeah, a bunch of good guys got mowed down by German machine gun fire, but in the end we won, right? So we, you're right, it's all about the deadline. And, and we've got some really harsh deadlines that we're up against. And we can also do it as an iterative process. It's like, hey, let's get the first baseline model done in 30 days. Is it gonna be perfect? Guaranteed it won't be perfect. Right, but let's see, you know, what are the obvious conclusions that pop out of that? And we start with that. We already know one of the most obvious ones, go plant-based. Okay, great. How are we going to accomplish that? Food healers. Right. So Sarah stepped up, Ingrid stepped up, I'm stepping up, we're all stepping up, and boom, food healers is happening in LA. Why LA? Because it's the media capital of the world. It's the cultural melting pot of the planet. If we can do it in LA, we can export it everywhere. Right. So the obvious things that pop out, we act on those first while we then go to phase two of modeling. Right. But we don't wait till phase 10 of modeling before we implement food healers in L.A. to get the, the world to go plant based. So that's it. Well, Shankar has his hand up. Yes. And you're, you're muted, Shankar. Yes. Yeah. BJ, I agree on the data data points like uh, some of them no real data or things are changing too. Uh, I want to ask Ray. Ray, you, re you remember there's one of the games or something you showed that is like a multivariate about the food, about the transportation, about the economy and, uh, but everything that one of the key part is about the R&D food and everything. Do you think it will be relevant? I play it twice a day, every day. <laughs> Prosperous universe. Yeah, but you you, like you could do it at a. I mean, I know that I see like a, in terms of modeling means there is a micro impact, macro impact. There's some of the things you could you could kind of span it for a city or a state or a country, but there are other things like the total environmental. You got to come from outside to inside. So does that does the does that game framework allow the, allows that or is there any factor? Like, I mean, when I say Jamin, what he's saying, I think it's a big model, right, Jamin? There's several parts rolled together and 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 especially the, the puzzle part is easier, but the bigger part from outside to inside, I don't even know how to imagine that. Well, I do because I've been building atmospheric models since I was a grad student at MIT in 1992. So I've been thinking and reflecting and what worked, what didn't work, why didn't it work, et cetera. Um, so we just need to get together the vegan modelers and just say, let's get on this. And then we all get in rooms just like this one, except it'll be a breakout room. They'll have the modeling team, the atmospheric team, the ocean oceanography team, the agriculture team, the soil science team, et cetera. Right now, all these different teams are going to feed data to the modeling team, right? The modeling team is sort of at the, at the heart of it. At the heart, we need an integrated computer model, right? Mm. Thank God it's 2021 and not 1976 because we've got great computers, great software. A lot of great model components have already been built over the decades. So these are like Lego blocks that we need to put together, but we need the Lego masters, myself included, to put them together. And we need all the vegan soil scientists, atmospheric scientists, oceanographers, ice experts, et cetera, to feed the modeling team with the data and the components. Well, okay. I just, go ahead, Shankar. No, I was just acknowledging that's all. Oh, okay. Um, I just thought of somebody, Julian Barnes, Julia Barnes, who did that documentary on the ocean that was so beautiful and the coral reefs, and now she's working on the other one, Bright Green Lies. She went straight up to the ocean, to some oceanographers. So she, and she and Silas know each other. So she may know somebody if y'all don't, uh, and there may be many others, but there's a, a direct connection I can see right there to, to somebody. 
and I suspect that she may know which ones are vegan or leaning vegan and seeing the connection there too. Okay, that was my part. I'll pass the feather. Beautiful, good. good. Ray, is it possible for you to show like, uh, I mean, when Jamin was explaining, only your thing came in my mind. <laughs> I don't know, I'm sorry to drag you. What it is, a Prosperous Universe is a space economy simulator. So the backstory is the uh, Earth had to be evacuated to escape a meteor and uh, the original whereabouts of the Earth is forgotten, but the uh, a section of the universe has been populated and now they've started to trade uh, mining specific resources depending what's available on different planets. So you, you're an entrepreneur starting out as a, with your company starting to grow food. I was a space farmer, but I had to expand and I made a very uh, vertical um, kind of corporation that was very self-sufficient. So I did my own building and smelting of metals and so forth to minimize the amount of uh, buying I'd have to do. But it's, it's quite uh, more accurately called spreadsheets in space. <laughs> it's just there's no graphic whatsoever it's just products commodities markets and uh it's it's very interesting but i think what it really replicates is a more of a silk road kind of economy where you're kind of it's just building an economy it's interesting uh to to see the mindset of an economist though uh what when you uh play a game that where the objective is to to grow the economy it's it's handy for me as an environmentalist to to see this mindset and kind of remember see how this fits into the world but it doesn't exactly fit our current paradigm because it doesn't you can't deplete these planets there's always more planets and that's exactly the problem that we have right now is we don't have more planets or faster than light travel. Jamin, have you, uh, like this approach and the modeling approach and so on, have you gone over that somewhat with um, Guy McPherson? I mean, what approach would he take since he's, I wouldn't say not, He's not an alarmist, but to some extent, he has probably sets of priorities. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, Guy McPherson, he, he's not a big computer modeling buff, um, so he hasn't really gravitated towards that. And also, he's you know he's he's a bit burned out after having tried to um, you know sound his own clarion call for you know, a couple of decades and essentially been ignored. Um, he's kind of, you know, his whole shtick now is only love remains because we're going down. So, you know, love, love all you can and live all you can on the way down. So he's not exactly the best guy to, for both those reasons. Um, but uh, he, he knows a lot of people. I mean, I've been trying to recruit guy mcpherson for years and i you know the best i can seem to do is get him to show up either at the sierra club or the press conference and be brilliant for an hour and a half give a talk and then you know we go have drinks and you know that's the end of that um so but you know we, and that's why i'm saying let's go after let's let's put the clarion call out to the vegan community because there are vegan guy mcpherson's out there right there are vegan scientists lots of them so let the, because the vegans are committed and um so i'm just saying let's 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 go to where you know when we put out the clarion call for la who answered but it's the same woman who ha has her hand up right now my sister sarah so so uh sarah uh, go ahead you got your hand up love to hear from you. you you're on mute sir hey everybody happy friday Hi. And 
Hope you, everybody's doing great, BJ. I'm so always happy to see you, of course. And I meant to tell you earlier, BJ, that Jane Unchained, Jane herself, I'm sure you probably already know this, but it seems like almost every one of her broadcasts includes, and that kindergarten teacher, and she just made it all sense for me, and blah, blah, blah. So, yeah, Jane loves you, BJ, just so you know. I wanted to give you a shout out tonight. And um, thank you. We have to work on her branding, though. She's so awesome. So, um, <laughs> getting back to um, the love thing, Phil Lane, I think Chief Phil Lane is our best. I mean, he's our liaison. He's so amazing. When he said that he was signing that treaty and all that stuff went down, I'm just giving you the short version. <laughs> But y'all already know because you were there. That treaty is so, like, we really need to embrace that treaty more. I think we shouldn't ignore it because we should get everybody to sign that treaty. Because when he said he was getting, I mean, that, that I don't even know if Jamin knows about the treaty, but Chief Phil Lane yeah. is yeah. a very good bridge to connecting everybody. Because what's happened is when we took the Indians' lands, then we became separate and everything started to become separate separated there's even a song about it and i want to use the joe biden term unify uh, unity and all that stuff i don't even want to use that word i want to say we need to come together like jamin's cafe we all come together at the community cafe and that's where everything happens. But I definitely don't think, and I think we definitely have Phil, Chief Phil Lane, of course, it, it help us with this because like Dr. Ralph said, we have to get everybody on board and then do it. But like I want to tell y'all, when we tell vegans that we're going to have a vegan world by 2026, vegans think we're crazy. Okay even though we're right and we already know what's going to happen. So we got to figure out a way like it, the plant-based method, like feeding and everything. Like we say, love all, feed all. And we give them the plant-based food. We don't owe them any explanation about what's in this because there's no explanation about what's in their macaroni and cheese. That's not even what they think it is. So we got to get off the apology thing and just get on the doing that's, I definitely want to say that, yeah, we have to have meetings and make plans and get in groups and stuff, of course. But like I said at the beginning, this is about basically being in Girl Scouts or Cub Scouts or whatever you want to call it, but being in the Scouts and having a project and then getting a badge for it, even though we don't really need a badge, but you know what I mean? So it's like that. So we need to follow what Himmel's doing because he already has the model. What Jamin's got, he's got the model. We've got to just get everybody together and somehow be, get them to come onto this conversation that we're on now and, and stop scaring them away from a 24-hour block party because even I was scared away from, from committing to that. So we got to figure out some kind of method of how to get people to engage. And then we have to be able to talk to Jane and let her know, no, Jane, you don't need to cook stew in your kitchen. Just chill. So we have to figure out how to how to package it in a way because really we're, we're we're salespeople we're salespersons we just have to sell it and asking is free just remember that always remember that in in sales asking is free so we really just need to get out there and do it and yeah we do need to refine it and fix it and this that and the other but yeah we do need to go ahead and get it going like we have to start planning okay we're gonna have a big conference buzzfeed you know we're gonna you know jamin's gonna come down we're gonna have you know that so we should be in the planning stages like we are in the incubation and we start going and making like i don't know revision boards or whatever you know what i mean that's my comment from me being on a three-hour speech contest and only winning second place but i'm happy because i don't have to do it anymore congratulations sarah congratulations that's 
Um, hey, second Sarah. place is the every everyone who won a gold medal in the Olympics first, you know, got second place at something. So you're you're on you're on track. Go, go ahead, BJ, or whoever is next. Yeah, no, no, no. Lo love it, love it, Sarah. Um, so basically, um, yeah, just like asking is free, let's ask Jane to, you know, uh, and, and I, I put the same ask to Silas, um, that we get on Jane Unchained next week and put out the clarion call to the entire vegan community to come together and form this planetary organization that will do not only food healers, because food, food healers is our racehorse right now. That's our lead, because that's what's going to get the world to go. Damon, why did you say that? Oh, and I'm why did I the say what? Way. Oh, I'm oh. so sorry. I'm so sorry. Here, another I, I, racehorse I, I, was killed. Another horse but was it's, killed. It's a, me, it's a mechanical. It's a mechanical. It's a mechanical horse. Solar powered. Mechan I'm sorry. OK. Um, it's our Tesla truck, let's put it that way. Uh, food Healers is our Tesla truck in the race, okay? And it's driven by Leilani Munter, okay? Give me a thumbs up, Sarah. Let me know I'm off the hook. All right, okay, thanks. Okay, so Food Healers is our Tesla truck, but it's not the only thing in the race. We need we need to put together so we, we spend a lot of time this evening in the last three hours talking about we need to put together a holistic model for donut economics for the entire planet and all the planetary boundaries so a big part of the clarion call is getting together the entire vegan community including the scientists the engineers the marketers the chefs the artists the publicists, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, the media folks, everything across the board to do uh, the push of, this is the single most important thing in the history of the planet that we're about to take on. And that's, what, I, I don't even have words for it, but it, it includes a holistic model. I'm, I'm a computer modeling expert. Um, I've been a few years out of practice because I've been doing this. <laughs> um, but uh, happy to get back into it. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the computer model is, is an essential part of it um, because we need to model all the planetary boundaries and all the solutions, not just the plant-based solutions, but the SRM solutions as well. BJ stepped up and, and said, hey, you know, as a, as a vegan, I, you know, I don't really respond to this SRM thing because it sounds a little bit artificial. And Silas answered that, hey, you know, even though it's not as pretty as, you know, permaculture and edible living forests to vegan ears uh, and vegan eyes, we need to, you know, embrace it. So w in order for us to be effective in both coming up with the solutions and selling the world on all these solutions, we need to grow up beyond just the vegan lens and look at the entire planet, all the planetary boundaries and all the solutions that we're gonna need, right? And so this is the clarion call. Now, it just so happens that the people best positioned to answer the clarion call happen to be vegan, right? Um, so be it, right? Um, whatever it takes, but let's put out the clarion call uh, because it, and it just so happens that our first solution, see, one of the cool things that's going to happen from the clarion call is we're going to get a whole bunch of supporters lining up behind food healers or a community cafe or whatever we end up calling it. All right. But we also need to address the modeling, the science, the engineering, and all the solutions. Right. All right. BJ has your hand up. Go for it, BJ. Thank you. Um, I don't know how this fits in, but here's a, a call that I think will get a lot of attention. I mean, it, I already posted it uh, on my Facebook page, um, but I don't have it marketed very well. But just February 2nd, uh, that article came up, COVID-19 lockdown temporarily 
raised global temperature research shows. So that shocks people. What? I thought with the lockdown and all the transportation being stopped, we would have cooled it. No, it's heating it. And that's that's your, a big way in. I think that ought to be on Jane Unchained. I think you start with that and then they go, what the heck? And then you say, so here's what we do. I mean, I don't think it, I don't think it, it's scaring, it's shocking. I mean, maybe they'll be scared too. I mean, we don't, sometimes we don't want to scare people, but we've already got some solutions coming. You know, we've already, we already know what can bring down the carbon. Um, and I have, that link? yeah, I, I, I will put that link right in there right now. I'm waiting to hear that because I know from uh, when 9-11 uh, shut down the, the flights for so long that it was actually measurable the amount of uh, the uh, aerosol mask fell a little bit, a, a measurable amount. And that was, uh, I'm not sure how long it was before they were able to uh, detect it, but obviously this is a much bigger uh, turn down of, of, uh, of our economy. Right, and when you, and when you read the article, it, it says it's very slight, you know, so, okay, so it's slight but it's of just a few months and um, it still shows the direction of what's going on. And I remember Silas, uh, when I asked him, well, is there some data on this? This was a couple of months ago or so. He said, well, people know, and I just couldn't find anything. So when this came up at the environmental coffee house the other day and the ladies were reading it, they were reading some other articles too. I just thought, yay, I'm latching onto it. So I, I, I just think this is a, this is what extra, um, XR, what's that called? Uh, Extinction Rebellion needs mm -hmm. to hear. This is what Citizens Climate Lobby needs to hear, but not in a, not like I feel sometimes like, see, I told you. <laughs> they, they don't need to hear that from me and I don't, I don't wanna do that, but they do need to hear it some way. Oh, look, here's some more science. What does this mean? Hmm, and let them see, oh, what do you know? Maybe I, sh maybe I will look at animal agriculture. Anyway, that's, that's what I'm thinking of as important as the clarion, it can either be brought into the clarion call or, or maybe it's a whole separate thing where that's, that's just talked about. Maybe it should be because it's quite a big topic. Thank you. Beautiful, beautiful. Yeah, I, I think we need we need the holistic call. See, no one has stepped up uh, to basically take on the whole of it, um, other than the IPCC, which is heavily, which is basically um, you know the the lobbying group for the for the union of global sociopaths you know, the, the union of global billionaires. Why? Because the billionaires control the governments, the governments control the United Nations, the United Nations controls the IPCC, follow the money, right? So, um, and and the, the billionaires are the most twisted, right? Um, and uh, so we're barking up the wrong tree. What we need is an objective citizen science, um, uh, open source effort to come up with an truly objective model and design for, for, for what we need to do. And, uh, you know, according to the IPCC, you know, reduce emissions, the planet cools. Well, we reduced emissions during 2020 and the opposite happened. The planet heated up. Why? Because of loss of global dimming. So obviously their model is wrong. That's the proof that their model is wrong. Boom. Here's your failing grade right there. Bam, here's the evidence that you failed. So, okay, if that's the wrong model, what's the right one, right? See, that's it. See, we're working it out right here on this call. We're working out the marketing of it. So um, here we go. So we're off to a flying start. We just need to put out the clarion call, get all the experts together. Instead of one Zoom room trying to figuring out the marketing, the engineering, the science of this, that, the funding, no, no, no. We need a whole... We need thousands of us organized into what I'm calling, you know, the intel for Mother Earth, led by Silish and Kamaya. 
and broadcast out on Jane Unchained, right? See, we have all the ingredients. We just need to organize ourselves, right? For the great Normandy assault on the forces of destruction. The forces of destruction, they're entrenched. The meat industry, the billionaires, you know, the United Nations, the governments of the world, those are the Germans on the, on the, the on Northwest coast of France. Uh, we need to organize the uh, the assault on the uh, on the Nazis of destruction, right? And let's put it in those terms. Why not? Whatever. Let's put it in whatever terms we need to put it. Whatever terms. I don't know because it, and, and the reason I say that I'm actually half serious when I say that because the one thing that history has shown over and over and over again that will get humanity to to organize and unite is an enemy tribe, right? We don't organize around eating plants. We don't organize around, you know, cutting down. We don't organize around anything but an enemy tribe. An enemy tribe will unite us every time. And right now we have the enemy. And so let's, let's and thank you, Sarah. So yes, they are Nazis. They are, right? They're omnicidal, um, blood drinking, meat eating Nazis, right? So let's take them out Normandy style. We need to organize. So the clarion call is, you know, let's all meet up in England and let's blast the hell out of them, <laughs> right? That'll, that'll get them, that'll get us together. I mean, what else, right? And, and just meld that in with the love-based uh, beliefs. <laughs> Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna blast the hell out of Nazis because of love, <laughs> because of love for Mother Earth, love for animals, love for ecosystems, love for the Amazon, love for each other, right? And now let's get back and getting back to blasting the hell out of the Nazis. Uncle Frank, you signing off? You're muted and that's okay. Can't hear you. You're on mute, Uncle Frank, and that's okay. Don't don't worry about it. We, we get we get we get the we get the picture. <laughs> you oh, need to now, get some sleep. Now I want to make I want to make one toss in one thing, Jamin, since you're the engineer among us. But what if you were to create sort of a rough, crude perch chart of some sort for people to criticize, to attack, or contribute to? Uh, because I keep thinking in terms of what you need to. Well, you have to possibly prioritize uh, all the different things that have to go forward. So I thought maybe that would be something that you could create at least for some people so that everybody would have something to uh, contribute to and possibly criticize and so on. Anyway, give it a thought. Yeah, no, no, we, we have. We've been at this for three hours and 15 minutes now. And actually, one of the things we talked about early on was that there are fundamentally three levers at our disposal for both cooling the planet and stopping the destruction of the biosphere, right? One is reducing carbon emissions. The other is going plant-based. And the third is solar radiation management, right? And so one ABC, one, two, three, there you have it and let people criticize all they want, let them support whichever ones they want. Right now, 99% of the focus is on reducing emissions. And as BJ just pointed out, what 2020 proved us is if you reduce emissions, the planet heats up. Why? Because of loss of global dimming. It's having the opposite effect of what we want, right? Imagine slamming on the brake pedal and the car accelerates into the brick wall. You know, something's wrong with this picture, right? And so I think I say we lead with that. Black ice. Yeah, yeah, thank I'm you. I'm breaks on black ice and you go faster. <laughs> yeah, so let's call it the black ice syndrome, 
right? Whatever, you know, this is where BJ comes in. This is where Ray comes in. This is where all of us come in and say, okay, how do we communicate this? Right. But I think we've got our opening, we've got our opening three minute scene of the James Bond movie. It's called Black Ice. You know, we, we, we slammed on the brakes and the car accelerated. What? Ba -da, da 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 And then you watch the rest of the movie. Uh, and you're now, but now you're bought in. Death Star because... blows up. What, what movie is this again? <laughs> <laughs> I can't tell you how pleased I was to find them talking about that. And and one yeah, we're, of the... we're... yeah, it's called the Environmental Coffee House. And one of the women, Jennifer Hyde, she's uh, she's been studying environmentals. So she called herself an environmental research, all, researcher, although that's not her background. I, I can't remember what it is. Um, yeah, I was just thrilled. So yeah, I, I wouldn't, I'm still excited about seeing it. And she knew about it, but she was waiting for papers. <laughs> so, yeah. So she, so I need to get her uh, Silas Rowell's paper. I did ask, I did write in the comments to get Silas Rowell on as a interview him, but I, I need, maybe I sent the paper. I don't remember. Uh, but they have a pretty good following. I don't remember what it is. I'd have to look. We need yeah, to but bring anyway, them into the Oh, sorry. We need to bring them into no, no, the yeah, 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 totally, totally. But you see, we've got our opening, we've got our opening arguments. The current leading model is wrong. It's not just wrong by a factor of 10% or 20%. It's wrong in the sense that they don't even have the sign right. Step number one with a model, get the sign right, right? If you push on this pedal, it's supposed to break the car. No, it accelerated. What? You, you can't get more wrong than having the sign wrong, plus or minus. You can't get any more wrong than that. It's not yeah. a matter of degree. It's a matter of you've got the sign wrong. Okay, so if that's the wrong model, then all right, well, let's go back to the drawing board. But you see, that's, that's what will finally get everyone back to the drawing board. So that's the beginning of the clarion call right there. Yeah. The current model is just completely wrong. Okay, well, maybe animal agriculture deserves a second look, people. <laughs> yeah, right? that's what I'm thinking. Yeah. Okay, so let's get back to the drawing board. Let's create the right model, right? Because we know emissions ain't it. That's, that's, that was proven. You couldn't ask for a better experiment. The best experiment we had had prior to 2020 was 9-11, 2001, when all the jet planes were down and we didn't have the chemtrails, <laughs> right? And the planet heated up. It all gets back, it, it all gets back to SRM. The chemtrails are SRM and 2020 was, was all about SRM. So let's start with that and then, um, you know, and then where do we go from there? That's why we need a, a, a thorough model. Yes, BJ. Or Ray. And, uh, we, we do have to say it's not that we don't need to get rid of the car, the carbons and the emissions. We do. But as Dr. Rao explained, we need to do it 10% at a time. So we bring down animal agriculture, cool the earth enough that when you then you can let out, you can cut down on the carbon because those are sulfates and carbon are bad. Bring down some more, another 10%, another 10%. So there is a, an engineering plan there. Um, but certainly the model of all we have to do is get rid of fossil fuels. Everybody stop now, which is what they say, or we're gonna go extinct when actually it's the other way around. We will go extinct if they stopped it all now. The way I see it. Okay, thank yeah. you. Yeah, and I think what's been missing from the narrative having, you know, studied uh, in depth Guy McPherson's arguments, Yay Tao's arguments, et cetera, is 
not only do we need to not decrease the dirtiest emissions, which are keeping us alive with global dimming, we need to replace them with mirrors, with clean mirrors that do the same thing, except way more of it, right? We actually need more SRM, not less. So, so the, again, the three, the three levers uh, are go plant-based, reduce emissions, and SRM, right? And so far out of those three, there's only one, pardon my uh, gesture here, but the only one that's been <laughs> presented is reduce emissions. And we're getting exactly this response from mother earth. So we need to dial that down and do more like uh, the Spock symbol from Star Trek. Um, <laughs> we need to do these two and then we can do the one in the middle, but the two biggies are plant-based and SRM, right? But let that not come out of my mouth, let it come out of the model. So the clarion call includes do the modeling as well as do the obvious of plant-based. Plant-based is obvious. We don't need models for that. We just need to do it. And that's where food healers comes in. So the path forward is food healers and modeling. And then whatever comes out of the modeling, we need to present that to the world. And one of the vectors for presenting it to the world is precisely food healers. Because with food healers, we get the attention of the world. Oh, they're feeding everyone. What's going on? What, what, what? Right? You see, we're getting, we're getting clear now. We're getting clear. And it took, you know, a year of conversation. This is block party number 50. <laughs> <laughs> right? It took a year of conversation to get this clarity. Now that we've got this clarity, let's put out the clarion call and take it the rest of the way. That's what the next 50 weeks are about. <laughs> and as my sister Ingrid could tell you, hablando se entiende la gente. Talking is how we understand each other and how we get clear. So we need to do more of this. We just need better organization and more of us. Hence the clarion call next week. Okay, Jamin, I'm gonna have to drop out for now. All right. For, for, first, say hello to Ingrid. Ingrid, le, le presento mi tío, tío Frank. Uncle hello, Frank, tío say hello Frank. to Ingrid. Hola, tío Frank. <laughs> y habla español, habla español. Oh, really? Okay, I was just kidding. <laughs> nice to meet you. Uncle Frank, you, I'm you're, you're still you. on mute and that's okay. Uncle Frank needs yeah. to go to bed. So Uncle Frank, have a good night. I do too. Good, good night, everybody. Yeah, I'm All also right, going to leave. Uh, All right, Jenkar. <laughs> right. All right, All right. Mm -hmm. have a great night, everyone. I actually need to take a break myself and have a little family time before before going to bed, but this has been hugely productive. Thank you all. This has been awesome. Everyone, yeah. as you, as when you put your head now. under your pillow tonight. Yeah, go, go ahead. Anne. No, I'm saying I could only come now, but I'm so glad to get to see you guys at least. Likewise, likewise. We've been at it for three and a half hours on food healers and then the two hours of El Puente before that. So it's oh, been a five and a half hours been five and a half hours straight for me on top of the four and a half hours this morning so yes, another 10 hour are. day but um it's a you labor of love oh thank you <laughs> thank you all right bj bj great work today seriously really awesome work thank you marco you too everybody great work and let's have a good night and as you put your head on your pillow tonight ray and everybody else Think clarion call. Think next yes. week we have to get all the vegans together and do this in an organized way. All right? Yes. You've got your, yes. you not your homework, but your dream work. Do it while you're dreaming. Put, <laughs> me, me, meditate on this before you, before you fall asleep tonight. And then in yes. the morning, Thank answers you. will pop out. Thank you so much, everyone. For tomorrow, all right, clarion call. Or, clarion or, call, clarion call. Clarion call. That's it. That's it. Well, remember what I mean. <laughs>
<laughs> anyway, this has been one of the best food healers meetings ever because we're we're getting clarity. We're getting really good clarity. So I want everyone to feel congr I congratulate everyone on this call. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Really awesome meeting. All right. Good night. Whew. With that, I'm going to stop the recording and we're going to all have a good night. Really great work, everyone. Seriously. This is history in the making and it's all recorded. So congratulations. All right. Love you all. Marco, can I make you host or who's uh, Christopher who wants to be host? Marco, I'll make you host and I'll let you take it from there. <laughs> okay. Thanks, everyone. Love to all. And uh, we'll see you all real soon. Next week, clearing call. That will change the course of history. That's the plan. That's the challenge. Namaste. Arigato gozaimasu. Tomo domo. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> All right. Namaste vegan. Namaste vegan. Love it. Okay. Have a great night, everyone.